What's up, everybody? Hello. I'm so fucking tired right now. <laughs> yeah, definitely happens when you work and you have a lot of shit going on. Oh, yeah. Is that where it comes from? It happens. Uh, Ryan Townsend. Yeah, uh, we sat down with Ryan Townsend on uh, Friday. Friday. He actually night. he actually didn't leave the house till 3 a.m. Yeah, he kept talking. Okay, so we did a three-hour podcast with the guy, yeah. and then I had to leave. I, I had to go somewhere out of town, but uh, as I was leaving, I saw you guys still talking, and I was telling Shelby, I was like, dude, he, they're going to talk all fucking night. <laughs> yeah, and there was plenty of times where I said, dude, we can turn them back on. We can turn the mic back yeah. on. And uh, no, but it was, a good, it was a good conversation. I think we also got to know each other a lot better. I mean, we've kind of hung out a couple times, but um, I, I really think we kind of kicked back ideas back and forth. And, you know, gained a little bit more perspective on both, like, the way we both saw things, I think we both now understand it a little right. bit better, too, so. But, um, yeah, it was, it was good, man. I was glad, you know, he's, he's here locally in Dallas, and, uh, you know, I just. For now. Yeah, for now. For now. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just wanted to get him on. He's a fucking amazing airbrush artist. He actually taught me a, a lot that has helped me hone my airbrush skills to where it's at today. Um, he's just an all-around rad dude, you know. So it was, it was good to get him on and get, you know, another artist. Like, we haven't, we've haven't we talked to a lot of custom painters, which are artists, no doubt, but... But he's like an artist. Yeah, artist. he's like... He's artsy as fuck. Yeah, he's an art nerd for sure. Yeah, that was cool. That was probably the coolest part, man. He's got a lot of uh, really cool perspectives on yeah, a lot of the shit yeah. that he was talking about, and uh, I definitely related to him a lot. Yeah, so we were able to get him on. It was good. Uh, we kind of caught him in between a lot of shit they got going on, which uh, you'll hear about a lot of his uh, plans and, you know some other things that are going on here in Texas for people that, that want to, you know, learn how to do custom paint and airbrush and stuff like that. So, um, what was that thing called? Uh, uh airbrush air, art, no, cir- or art circus. Art circus. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Sorry. Yeah, that's We're, a cool ass fucking thing. You'll hear about it in the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So it was cool getting them on. Um, also, you know, you probably heard about this, but last week we, uh, we kicked off, not we as in like it's ours, but just, you know, we kind of kicked off a uh, a little bike night here in Dallas-Fort Worth yeah. uh, at the Anvil Pub, which we kind of just made it to where every Tuesday, you know, just come out, 8 o'clock, yeah. there'll be people there. There was, I want to say there was 30 bikes, uh, 30 Dinas, FXRs, and my bagger. <laughs> and your one bagger. <laughs> and then, but there could have been a few less, but it was a lot of people. Hell, we, we kicked it from 8 to 11.30, just talking and shooting yeah. shit and and it was a good time, man. So if you're around Dallas, Fort Worth, and you want to come out and hang it, there you go. That's happening. For sure. Um, as always, this podcast, you know, it's brought to you by Mr. Mark Matthews at Texas Performance. Um, don't forget to check him out if you haven't. Uh, then you the must fuck, not dude? have been listening to yeah, us. Like, what do you, like, I don't know. Do you just fast forward this part? What the fuck, dude? Probably. You know, check him out, texasperformancemc.com and on IG. Uh Rad dude, actually looking forward to hanging out with him at Texas Hills. Um, got a lot of shit going on that we need his help for. So, you know, you know, our T-Sport build, we need to get our motor over there to him and see what we're working with. Uh, my personal FXR, I need to get that over to him and see if it's, you know, if the motor's still got life or if it needs to be completely rebuilt. I mean, I'm sorry, but hopefully I don't have to see him anytime soon with the bike I'm buying right now. <laughs> there you go. I don't want to see him. Um, but yeah, for sure. He'll, he'll be, you know, down there with us, Texas Hills, doing all that fun stuff and, uh, you know, should be a blast as always. Yeah. It's always a blast. Also, uh, we got Peyton Huff from Metal Flake back on board. Uh, they, they kicked back in to help us out, keeping this thing going, keeping it, uh, growing, if anything. Going and, and growing? Yeah. Mm, so, uh, see what you did there. we use, you know, it's, it's easy to plug guys like Peyton Huffer and Mark when they're personal friends of ours the people right. that we we use to ki- you know make our business run you know outside this podcast um i just sprayed some fucking gold flake finally today i've had it for about six months and i finally found some use for it so i'm, pe- I'm pretty excited i want to do some more gold based uh, flaked out jobs and yeah. build from that so i'm getting kind of tired of spraying silver yeah <laughs> and doing silver out the ass so. yeah um no but paint up for metal flake man you know leader in the industry of flakes and all that type of stuff you can't really beat that guy for sure when it comes to that stuff so check him out paint huffer metal flake on ig and i think it's just paint i'd probably have to double check that it's been a while since i, I did an ad for these guys yeah i do believe it's just paint yeah it's just paint so check him out um 
they got all the rad shit, dude, and they support all the raddest painters in the game. So, mm-hmm. you know, you can't go wrong with that shit. Also, uh, don't forget about Danger Dan, mcshoptees.com. Uh, I don't know if you saw or if you follow him, but our good buddy FXR Mike uh, loaned him his uh, side, hack. side hack to take down to, which I think we talked about this. In <laughs> yeah, the, uh, we talked one. about this a little bit. But, yeah, I mean, that, that was just super rad, and that just kind of shows you the kind of community of, of, you know, how rad these dudes are and how, how closely knit everything is. You know, it's, it's pretty awesome. I think I'd probably let him take my bagger, too, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> everything he has leaks oil, so. Yeah, and bring it back, and it we'll ain't got see. no oil in it. But, uh, no, check out Danger Dan. His podcast is rad. It's a good thing to listen to if you're, not, if you're all caught up with ours or, you know, you just want to get some. He's got a lot of great guests and stuff on his, so you can definitely – gain from that one as well uh and like i said mcshoptees.com uh get on that monthly t-shirt t-shirt subscription thing Mm -hmm. make it happen we got two weeks until texas hills and we got three weeks until me and the wife head to cali for a vacation workcation podcastcation all kinds of vacations some more vacation inception type shit. Yeah. Yeah, some more inception shit. We always do that. Yeah, there's well, no such mind. thing as a vacation. It's just like, hey, I'm going to take my wife to Cali, but I'm also going to do podcasts and, and drop and pick off bikes and drop them and off. I and I might stuff. just take enough time to enjoy it. Yeah. Just enough. Anytime you get to see that ocean, it's a good time. Yeah. So, uh, we're we're pretty, pretty good with that. Uh, we got... Jesse's got me lined up with work for the next three weeks that I'm trying to get knocked out before we head out. And then we got some pretty dope projects coming on next month and therefore on. And we got more helmets than fucking cycle gear, I feel like, right now. You know, like we have so many helmets to paint and they keep coming and I keep telling them no. And they're like, come on, dude. And I'm like, no. And they're like, dude. I'm like, dude. Just a tip. And I'm like, okay, man. I, so technically, I don't think I have enough time to taint, paint any more helmets till August. Right. But I'm sure I'll fucking, I don't know. As long as everybody's cool, I'm cool. You just, you know, when you're doing these when jobs. When you're getting a helmet, don't expect to have it done in two weeks type shit. Yeah. Show. It's <clears> like, <throat> I want every helmet that we paint to be. Standalone on its own badass. I want it to be badass. I don't want right. to do any. If I, don't, if I paint a helmet and, I don't, and I'm not pr- proud to take a picture of it, I don't want to do it. Right. So. You know, in doing that, you know, you got to be able to, you know, say, hey, dude, this ain't happening. This this design, we're not on the same page or, I, you know, I'm I'm not feeling it right now or I need a little bit more time to kind of work out this color concept, you know. And so far, everybody's been super rad and super, uh, you know, understanding of the art process that's, that's going that way. And I'm happy. I'm happy when dudes are not on my dick. I mean, not dick, but uh, on my Whoa. ass. Sorry. <laughs> It's got the little, first thing that came to mind. They got a little hood in here. Yeah. Well, just when, when they're not on my ass trying to get me to rush things out, you know. I mean, we do, we do, we turn out work pretty quick for yeah. a custom paint shop. So, you know, but I don't know. I'm just Especially rambling. For two fucking so. people. But yeah, uh, like I said, we sat down with uh, Ryan. Uh, you guys got to check him out on all his social media, which he'll talk about in this podcast. Uh, amazing fucking airbrush artist, amazing mm-hmm. tattoo artist. Y'all, y'all touched on uh, some of SEMA and some yeah. stuff about SEMA as well. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that uh, he was more reserved in his thoughts, which is cool. You I, know, for his own reasons. Well, I mean, I he, mean of course, it's his perspective of it. My right. perspective was a little different, and or I have a little bit more animosity towards a certain you know corporate. I feel like stuff. we're talking about it. It just sounds like you guys are fighting about it. No, <laughs> like it the way we're talking about it. We were just, uh, you know, we were both. <laughs> You know, just talking no, about it, it sharing was good. ideas. We were here in the garage on this fucking table. They were drinking beer. I was sitting here sober, Sally, because I had to do a four-hour drive or a two-hour, I guess. I split it in half, so it was a good time. Uh, I was pretty stoked he came out. Kind of fanboyed for like two seconds. You know, <laughs> I was like, "Oh, hey, what's up?" But uh, yeah, so uh, here it is. Check it. Hey guys, you ready to let the dogs out? Fast life. Okay, so we're fucking live. <laughs> so if anybody wants to start talking, yeah. Well, uh, guess introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Ryan Townsend. Uh, for those of you who don't know him or follow him, so probably uh, more of you motorcycle guys. He's a phenomenal airbrush artist. That uh, that's how I found out about him because I yeah. I took a picture of something that was at the IMS show. 
They took they, a picture of your they, uh, uh, Marilyn. No, your I think the it, the brass balls, uh, brass balls. tank yeah. you did. And I was like, dude, this is the best fucking shit I've yeah, ever seen in my fucking, life. Who's the chick on the top of that tank? I don't know who the girl was on the top. I know you. Used I face did. On the I back. there was a a photographer that I got photos from Michael. I don't know say his last name. It was like Malak or something. Uh-huh. Malak. Um, and I found his photos, and I really liked his like noir. Um, old Hollywood style mm-hmm. of lighting. So I sent him a message and I asked him if I could use his photos um, as references to airbrush on a motorcycle because I wanted that noir. I was mm-hmm. into that at the time. So um, he gave me permission and I just found my favorite ones and then he gave me the uh, full Yeah, the resolution. large files, yeah. And that's what I did on the tank. So I used three of his photos. And most people who see that one, they think I did some sort of transfer or something. Mm-hmm. But I didn't. I painted it. I remember, wouldn't the, the, was it Everest Action that featured that painting in the magazine? Yeah, it's been in a lot of different magazines. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think the, there was a how-to article in Everest yeah. Action. Yeah. yeah, I want to say that that was, and that was one of my favorite ones, um, just the, the dramatic lighting that was in that. Yeah, the lighting was important. I used that one to learn about lighting, actually. I, when I paint things, I'm, a lot of times I'm learning as I paint it, and I learned a lot about contrast and lighting and photography by just recreating those paintings yeah. or those photos. And um, so I, actually on the rear fender, um, I, did a, I did a painting of my girlfriend, Faith, mm-hmm. where I... So I painted the tank first, and I did the, I think I did the top one first, which mm-hmm. was the one that everyone thinks is like Marilyn Monroe or something, or Christina Aguilera. Christina Aguilera is who yeah. I thought it was, yeah. Yeah, but it's not. It's uh, I don't know who the model is, but um, I did that one first, and then I did the two sides, and from there I was kind of starting to catch on to how the lighting worked. Yeah. And I wanted to create an original piece of art, um, so on the back I had my girlfriend. We went in my bedroom, and I gave her like a I think she had like a nice blouse or something Mm -hmm. and um I used a um what I use I used a lamp like a table like the ones with the like the regular lamp draped lamp you know it's like a normal lamp and I put a sheet over the top of it and I made it look like a spotlight the lamp I don't know how it just just worked yeah yeah I just rigged it and um I knew that it needed direct light and it needed to kind of look like a spotlight, but it needed to be like a, a muted light. So I used a sheet to kind of mute the light. And um, I put her real close up against the wall, and then she did some poses for me. And then I shot some nice photos, and um, I painted from those photos um, in my new mm-hmm. new way that I was learned off of his photos. And my favorite painting I think I've ever done mm-hmm. was the one of Faith on the rear fender. This yeah. One? Yep, that one there. Yeah, yeah. Super I pulled badass. it back up. Yeah, yeah. well, I, you know what was really cool about that whole um, uh, the way you you did all that artwork. It was good. Is that a transitional period where I feel like a lot of people when they would airbrush chicks, it was kind of like the lowrider scene. So they were just looking for the biggest tits and the you know nipples popping through the shirt. Yeah. And, well, I guess my influences were different. Um, yeah. At the time, I go through spells where I'm into certain things. In fact, right now I'm kind of feeling a little bit. Um, uninspired i don't have anything that's like i'm really yeah um, pushing it yeah not 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 anything that's original anyway it just happened to be at that time uh i was painting for brass balls which they kind of have that bobber thing but i thought all bobbers were always just flake and and Mm -hmm. and patterns and i love flake and patterns but there's no opportunity for me to show off on those and so i was like how do i do something that kind of falls into the same nostalgic look Mm -hmm. of a bobber but um i'm able to really show off and i thought those really those noir like old hollywood um headshots really yeah that's 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 it that's it i think uh, those now that i'm actually thinking about it because i do a lot of headshots on the helmets that i do and i think that maybe i was inspired by a lot of that shit because you also did that back that ass in for what was it da baggers which where you did that all the oh, blue all the, and, and you yeah. had like James Dean and Marilyn mm-hmm. Monroe right. and well that was another thing see when I did the for instance the first brass balls one that one I wanted to do the old Hollywood but I didn't want to do I want I didn't want to be just another guy doing Marilyn Monroe yeah right so um 
so th so that's why I looked for an original photographer that was current that was doing the same style but it was modernized. That's a good idea. So that's how I found Michael. Yeah. And then I think he's actually if anyone wants to look I, I think it's Malak. He's he's done a few like books of um pinups uh with airplanes and mm -hmm. like that old bomber style pinups. But anyway, um going back to the the blue one. Um, that's the one where I did Marilyn Monroe and everything. So again, I didn't want to just be another guy painting pictures of Marilyn Monroe. So, uh, the owner of that bike, he and I, um, uh, had a consultation and I always try to get people, in fact, I do this today, I get people to just kind of talk to me mm -hmm. and let the ideas kind of come to us as we're talking in a conversation yeah and so i was thinking about oh wouldn't it be cool if they were playing poker and um we just started coming up with this story and through that uh, we made it we just kind of decided like what if all of these you know old um you know 30s and 40s and 50s um movie stars were all in heaven but you know, it's like if you went to heaven, you probably wouldn't just be like wearing white and, yeah. you know, looking on. You'd probably be partying like you always do. Right. <laughs> and so, like, I figured they would probably still be doing the same things, going to nightclubs, still playing poker, still, you know, doing their dancers thing, yeah. and all that good stuff. And so we kind of come up with this thing where they're they're like at a nightclub and they're just cutting up and but they're in heaven, just like yeah. raising hell still. Yeah, it was cool because like uh, I think that. You know, one side you had like all the chicks from that era kind of playing poker, like mm -hmm. strip strip yeah. poker, I guess you'd call it. And so, uh, and then what was on the other side of the bag? The other side was Marilyn Monroe. Um, Just by herself. By right? herself. See, that was the first one we did, and um, the whole concept hadn't come to us yet. Yeah. So Marilyn Monroe is like in heaven because she's got the angel wings. Yeah, that's right. It had the wings. Right. On it. Yeah. yeah. But on the other side, the actually the scene doesn't break all the way around the rear of the bagger so if you're standing on the side of the bagger getting the the side of the bag mm -hmm. and you're looking at all the uh, women playing poker there's actually with each one of their expressions because i actually uh photographed this one too i had my girlfriend and my um my cousin and her friend all pose for it mm. so they posed and i made sure that the faces that i wanted to use of the um, actresses, yeah, that their bodies were mimicking the faces. So whatever pose they were in, I wanted their necks and everything to match. So because yeah, a lot of times, yeah. if you put a head of somebody on a different body, then it doesn't match. Right. So, um, yeah. So what I did was, uh, I had them pose at a table, and I took photos of them to where their bodies match but the thing is there's a story there yeah so like you'll notice that like Marilyn they're playing strip poker so Marilyn Monroe has just lost yeah so she's taking off her top and she's but she's still like having a good time with it so she's throwing her bra in the air and um so you photographed all that though right so how was yeah. the photograph there <laughs> what my so, girlfriend yeah it was my girlfriend I'll, isn't it? So there's nobody else naked in the picture? I can't remember. Well, my girlfriend was only ever... So what they did is they all sat at the yeah. table um, and did their poses. And then everybody left the room. And then it was just me and my girlfriend. And she sat oh, at the same okay. chair. And she did the topless part. And then everyone came back in. <laughs> that's, that's the only way I could ever think of it. You know, I, I stopped I, doing that type of work just because of pure laziness, right? Because... That amount of uh, work that you put in to do that just shows like your passion towards the um, the Artistic, art itself. Yeah, you know, like <clears throat> like you weren't affected by the idea of just man, you know, getting the job done. And well, getting at the time, the you know, when you've got this industry where everybody is trying to outdo everyone else, and the problem is, I think everybody's chasing everybody else. So if you're not chasing anyone. Like, if you're trying to stand out, the only way to really do it is to, like, be original. Mm -hmm. And that means you shouldn't grab your inspiration from other photos of other motorcycles. You should grab your inspiration by just, like I said, I can't, if I just sat there and you said, Ryan, come up with something cool, I will never come up with something. But if I can talk to the client and have a conversation and through that conversation, let the ideas flow. Mm -hmm. And as they flow, then... Um, you can compile something. I mean, like right now with my tattoos, I, I still get writer's block because most people come to me with an idea they found on Pinterest or whatever. And 
so they're always saying, hey, I want this. So they show me a picture of another tattoo. Mm -hmm. And it limits my creativity because all I'm going to do is chase somebody else's originality. Yeah. So it's always better. And I don't get the option to do this because I have to tattoo every single day. Mm -hmm. I have to do a new tattoo. So like, I don't, I, can, I don't have the time to have those conversations with people where the, we can put a lot of effort into the um, concept. I'd like to. I'd love to if I could get to a point where I could um, afford to spend a lot more time on yeah. one idea and let the concept come, then you're not, again, you're not chasing other people's ideas. You're letting it come from uh, an organic source, which is a conversation, you know? Yeah. So, well, look, I guess when we already kind of talked into it. So I guess let's back up and talk about like, you know, uh, I know for a fact from the times that we've hung out and you've talked, but you know, you said that your dad is the one that kind of got you into the paint and body yep. thing and you kind of, how did, so you grew up in the paint and body shop more or less, but like where was the transition from the traditional paint and body to where you found art and how did you bring it together? Uh, that's a funny story. Um, okay, so when I was a kid, my dad was always a custom painter, but mainly he painted cars on the line Yeah. Uh, in a body shop. But he was also really, really good at, um, doing flames and, and, you know, candy and flake and all that good stuff. Yeah. And at the time, because it's the job my dad did and my dad worked hard and he was never home and he'd always have bloodshot eyes from, you know, how much work he put in. And I never saw what he did as art per se. Mm -hmm. I knew what he did was art, but I didn't see it that way. It was work. Yeah. And it was hard work because my dad worked hard. So I never put those, that connection. So when I was a kid and I started kind of being an artist, that was just what I did at school with my friends because it impressed people mm -hmm. that I could draw really well. And so I liked the feeling that I got from impressing people, so I kept doing it. So those were two separate things. Like painting cars is what I did as a chore when I went home because my dad would put me to work. And drawing and painting was something separate. So even though I was helping him do flames and stuff like that, I didn't, in my mind, it wasn't art. Yeah, yeah. It was work. And so um, it wasn't until like later in life, like, because when I was graduating high school, I knew that I wasn't like a college type person. And so I went and I made a bunch of mistakes and, you know, didn't know my direction and all that. And then I was like, well, screw it. I, I guess you have to go to college to be successful. That's what I'm told, right? You know, that's what everyone's told. And so I went to art school and I took a tattoo apprenticeship to try to make money. That didn't work out because tattoos back then were still like a kind of Real a rough primitive. environment. Yeah. yeah. And um, it just kind of went south. And I kind of was like, didn't know where I wanted to be in life and what I wanted to do. And I still didn't see what we did on cars. Because me and my dad, we used to paint cars and bikes. Like I painted bikes for... Um, you know, I was still in the motorcycle scene when I was a kid. Like, yeah. I, you know, I, I remember one of the coolest things when I was younger, like Billy Lane complimented my bike and didn't know that it was me that did yeah. it. You know, yeah. I, was, I was like 17, 16 at the time. And so like, that was a big thing, but I still had, I still didn't have the connection yet because yeah. for some reason, airbrushing to me in my mind was a, a gimmick or, yeah. or like, you know, it's, it wasn't, um, Art, art, you had to use yeah. paint or something. I didn't have the connection yet. So um, I guess, you know, fast forward again, you know, um, school wasn't working out because I couldn't make any money. Um, the tattoo thing fell through because, you know, tattoo scene was rough. And so I decided I was going to move to Hawaii and just like do, <laughs> do caricatures on the beach. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I don't have any connections to anything. But fuck it. But fuck it. I'm yeah. going to Hawaii. And I called my dad and I told my dad, I was like, hey dad, um, you know, this shit ain't working out and I don't have anything else to do. So I'm just going to go waste away in Hawaii until I'm done with it. And then I'll come back and start a life, you know? And um, he was like, well, I can't argue with that. I mean, you don't have any real responsibilities. So yeah, there's nothing holding you down. Here. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, well, let's do it. And so my dad was like, well, how are you going to get to Hawaii? And I said, uh, well, I don't know. I guess I'll figure it out, you know. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I'll take some jobs or whatever and save up the money to go. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what. I've got these motorcycle helmets in this. Um, he said, I have a helmet and like a um, mini dragster. He goes, 
they want artwork on it, but you know, it's I, I can't do what they're asking. Mm. It was Joker or something. And I was like, well, I can't do it either. I mean, I, I can draw pictures with pencil and paint, but I don't know how to airbrush. I mean, I knew my way around an airbrush, but I wasn't an airbrush artist. And so he was like, he was like, well, if you do it, you'll have the money to go to Hawaii. Yeah. And uh, I was like, can't argue with that. So, um, <laughs> so I, I drove back to Oklahoma from Dallas <clears throat> and um, he just pretty much just like gave me a helmet and an airbrush and said, figure it out. And so... Um, my first real job was, you know, my, my first time even using an airbrush really. I mean, I, I knew my way around it, but I never practice on it customers. <laughs> yeah. It was my, my first practice yeah. to, to figure out what an airbrush even was really was on a customer's yeah. helmet. And it was the first time I ever took it seriously because my motivation before was like, let me grab this airbrush and try it out. And then I would be like, I ah, fuck this thing, mm-hmm. you know, cause it's, it's hard. It's way different when you're coming from like resting your hand. Yeah. On a paper. I've always said that, like, I, I envy, like, graffiti artists because they're used to, like, you know, they have a hand-eye coordination that a lot of us that had, like, the ability to rest our hands on a table. Right. Just didn't quite have yet. Like, I didn't have, have any coordination with a hairbrush. We have, airbrush. like, yeah. eye finger, con- con- you know, coordination. <laughs> yeah. You know I mean, we're just doing this. But, you know, when these guys <clears throat> are just fucking whipping lines with, a, with a, a spray can, then you throw an airbrush in their hands it's just way more fluid for them. So I feel like they get it a lot quicker than yeah. some of Well, us. I think when you have proper motivation, you know, like yeah, I sure. wanted to, like money has never motivated me, honestly, because I, I never really valued material things as much as other people for the yeah. most part. And so I was always motivated by experiences and by, you know, you know, whatever. So if I knew that I needed money to go to Hawaii, so now I was motivated yeah, yeah. for the first time. Same exactly. Yeah, so like... I did that um, first helmet, and then the mini dragster was next. So I did the mini dragster, and the next thing you know, there's another helmet and another mini dragster. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just do this one and that one, and then I'll have more money to go to Hawaii with. And then another bunch of shit lined up, and then I was like, okay, I'll do this one and this one and this one, and then then I'll go to Hawaii. Then it got to where they were backing up. Yeah. And I was like telling my dad, you know, and everyone, and I was stressing. I was like, okay we gotta slow down because i'm going to fucking hawaii i'm not i'm not i'm, I'm not i'm serious yeah. and but then they they kept coming and i kept getting better then all of a sudden i was getting so good i was having fun with it and then i was like well if i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do it right because yeah. at the time i wasn't exposed to airbrushing too much i didn't know what good looked like yeah and so i was like well if i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it like an artist, like I paint, you know, like, cause I was already an artist and that was my big driving. That was my identity. Yeah. And so I started trying to make my airbrush do, cause I wasn't good with an airbrush. I, I just knew that it, it was what you'd use to put artwork on stuff on motorcycles. So I was like, I'm going to make this airbrush do what I already do with a pencil or with a, a paint, mm-hmm. you know, a paintbrush. And so I was sitting there and I was trying and I was trying and I was trying and I was getting better and, and, you know, you know, people are patting you on the back and that feels good. And, um, but then I was started to follow some airbrushers and this is my first exposure to other airbrushers. Mm-hmm. Cause I didn't, like I said, I didn't what, know what, what year was like. this? Like what, what time from like 2008, seven? Yep. It was 2008. Yeah. Cause I remember, I remember you came on my radar and right when Facebook kind of got, yeah. got going. Well, it, See, that's the funny thing. I was 25 when I started airbrushing. Yeah. But I had been in the paint and body business, and I had been an artist since I was a little kid, since yeah. I was two. I just I would I was doing both separately. Yeah. I never it never put occurred to me to put them together. Even though my dad was already a custom painter, it's just never crossed my mind because I'd never been exposed to any airbrushing that I thought was Art. worth it. I, th- yeah. I thought all of it looked like garbage and. And I just hadn't seen what good looked like. Mm-hmm. And although I did see, there was one guy that I saw when I was a kid, but I never got a, I never got a good look at his work. And he's probably one of the best airbrushers I've ever seen now. Mm-hmm. But uh, if he was around, because he had moved to, there was a guy named his, his Charles Armstrong, the kid. Yeah. If he was around still, because he was living in um, Phoenix around the Phoenix, same time. Yeah. If he was still around, I would have been exposed to real art. Yeah. And I, I didn't, so I didn't. Yeah, because he's an Oklahoma native. He's yeah, back, yeah. He I was living now. in Oklahoma when I was a yeah. young kid, and the first time I saw one of his pieces was 
um, at a car show when I was really, really young. And my dad was just tripping on it. And yeah. I was just like, like, I want to do that one day. Yeah. It, and it, so he's got some fucking swag with his shit, man. Yeah. And so I, and, but the, the, it never stuck with me. If I think if, if Charles would have been around and done yeah. some of his Charles stuff while I was there, he, maybe he did. I just didn't see it because he was in the, like the mini truck scene the mini truck, yeah. and I was more attached to like the motorcycle scene. So I, I, if I saw it, I didn't know I saw it. Yeah. And so, but like his stuff he's doing today is just ridiculous. He's so yeah. good. But, um, anyway, uh. But by the time I, I so it was when F- MySpace is what we had at the yeah, time. Yeah, that's probably where I was seeing it. Yeah, so I was using MySpace to try to follow other airbrushers, and I found a guy named Corey St. Clair. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and um, the thing about Corey was, like I said, I was trying to make my airbrush do what I what my paintbrush mm-hmm. did. And everyone that I saw before that was their airbrush looked like airbrush. Mm-hmm. Corey was the first person that I saw where his airbrush looked like, like paintbrush. Traditional, yeah. yeah, like a traditional painter. And so I was like, that's it. That's what I've been trying to figure out this whole time. You know, I feel like, you know, because I was, you know, that was my way of living too at that same time. When, when Corey St. Clair first came on the scene... Uh, and he was bringing that flavor mm-hmm. of like realism and not like flood lines and dagger strokes and all this crazy shit. Like he, you couldn't see that. In it. I mean, no, you could see what you saw in Corey's work was the layering, the texturing. Like I remember the first piece and the only piece I'd seen at the time was uh, a Joker truck that he did. And if you look close at the skin textures, it was almost like each individual brush stroke was like impressionistic. It was just like each brush stroke mattered. Whereas like if you look at a typical airbrush um, painting, um, you can see the grains of the airbrush. You can see the overspray because it's made with um, it's just like you know, a t- you know like yeah. sh- 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 you know like. Whereas Corey's work was very tight and very small to where he didn't use the overspray to create his transitions. You know what's crazy is when he came on the scene. It was right around the same time when Nico Hiralta came on the scene for the tattoo industry, right? Nick, uh, how do you say his name? Uh, you, you just threw it out of my brain. It's Nico Hurtado. Hurtado. Yeah. I don't know why I said Geraldo. <laughs> like Geraldo or some shit. Yeah. But no, like, I remember when he came on the scene and like you were just saying how you were kind of doing the tattoo thing. I was also as well. And like, there was just this stagnant thing in the tattoo industry where people were doing shit work. And there was like a sprinkle of people in the United States that did some really Well, the thing nice about stuff. it is, and this is what kind of threw me off of tattoos originally, tattoos, especially here in Dallas, are very traditional, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's very cultural. And so they don't like when people come in and change things. They, they hate it. Be, and I don't know why it's that way. People, they get into their little cliques or whatever, and they feel like it is what it is, and you shouldn't do anything differently. Um and Nico and a few other people, um, they were in California where people, it's the, the, com- the competition is so thick in California, you can't get away with just being another guy who does roses. Yeah. You have to do something different. And you have to push the boundaries. So, and I don't know Nico's story, but I have to assume that he just said, fuck it, I'm going to do this like a painting, like an oil painting, yeah. and, and, and screw what, I, what people told me I couldn't do. And that's what they told me. When I was first in tattooing, I wanted to tattoo like I painted again, but I was told flat out, no. Yeah. You do not do that. You think you're the first one to think you're so cool that you can do this? You can't. You either do it this way or it's wrong. I think it's awesome how guys like him and Corey and even yourself – have revolutionized, uh, you know, Nico and in, in tattooing you and, and Corey and Airbrush. You've revolutionized uh, taking other forms of art and techniques from other types of mediums and things like well, that. Well, you have to. If you're just you chasing this, you, you can't be chasing your own tail. You can't be the same guy doing the same things as everyone else. Mm-hmm. If everyone is pulling from the same pot, you're not going to get any original ideas. You have to venture out. You have to find inspiration elsewhere. And... Um, and it's not even something you should necessarily look for just what is interesting to you. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you're watching a movie, like for instance, Thor Ragnarok, this Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's a 
one of the most amazing, beautiful movies. Yeah. And Love so, the soundtrack too. Yeah. So if you're yeah. watching Thor and it inspires you because of the colors that is used in that or because of the way that things are framed, take that inspiration into your work. Don't take someone else's motorcycle into you your know, work. You uh, know, I, I think I want to... I think I heard this this saying on another podcast, but it actually uh, revel or it's similar to that. It's like you, some of us, and I know I'm this way. It's I'm constantly in, looking for inspiration for what I do in every aspect of life, whether it's a movie or right. a, a song or an ad in a magazine or just something I see going down the road. So it's like when you when you're tuned into that frequency you're always looking for inspiration you know what i mean mm-hmm. and so i'm i feel like when i watch movies and that, i'm a big movie buff i love movies i love that shit i get a lot out of it because i'm looking for something in it you know what i mean as opposed to just being entertained i i don't even see the world the same way anymore like my artistic eye is pretty much controls the way i see so when i look at for instance, when I look around the room and I see a box or something, I see its form. I don't see what it is. I don't, you know, like, so I'm always... So you're living in the matrix. You see numbers. No, I, I analyze. No, I'm always analyzing how would I paint that? Yeah. And what is its shape? And what is yeah. its weight? And what is its texture? How does the light reflect off of it? The clouds get me every time. Before I was, uh, took my artwork as seriously as I do today, I would look at clouds like anyone else. Like, oh, that's a pretty cloud yeah. and move on. But now I study them. I, I'm asking myself about the shape of the, the anatomy of the cloud. Why is it dark in the center? Why is the mass the way yeah. that it is? Why is the light reflected the way that it is? Do you remember the airbrush artist? Uh, he, he passed away, but uh, Jaime Rodriguez? Of course, I met him. I All went right. to his shop. Yeah. This dude, when he came, when he came into my spectrum of, of you know, stuff, he did the most sickest clouds I've mm-hmm. ever seen. Mm-hmm. And I know he, he he's his amazing airbrush arts. He did some amazing things in his life. But what sticks out to me, and, and even while I'm bringing this guy's name up right now, you know. Because he would sculpt his clouds. He didn't yeah. draw his clouds. And That's the difference. I don't even say the word draw anymore. I'll yeah. say it if I'm goofing off. Like, what are you doing today? I'm drawing pictures. Because I think that's such a kindergarten thing to say. Yeah. Like, I'm not, I don't draw shit. I, in my mind, I sculpt it. And I feel like Jaime, when he did his clouds, he was sculpting the clouds. He wasn't yeah. drawing clouds. In fact, that's one thing I need to remind myself with my clouds currently, now that you're talking about it, is just, like, stop drawing shit. Sculpt it. Fig, you know, because if you watched how Jaime would do his clouds, he would find the form of the cloud, and he would allow the cloud to, t- to take its shape. Yeah. And he would sculpt the volume of the cloud rather than drawing a cloud clouds are shaped like this squiggle 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 yeah. shadow 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 cloud yeah he would he would let the cloud form in fact i watched him airbrush a hat for me which i lost immediately after i hate myself for it but um <laughs> I, i'm i'm terrible i didn't even make it home with that freaking hat <laughs> i hate myself party too hard i don't know i wouldn't even party and i just i'm just an absent-minded idiot but <laughs> But anyway, um, he was painting a hat for me. He was on the phone. He had a broken hand, or he cut his hand. He said he cut it um, taking the trash out. He slipped and fell. And so he had his hand in a brace. He, had a, he was on the phone the whole time. And with his braced hand, he was painting the skull while bullshitting on the phone. Yeah. And the skull was fucking amazing. And again, and I watched him do the skull. He would let the skull take shape, so he would always flood it with color. So he'd, he'd do a little bit of shapes, and then he'd flood it, and then he'd pull the shape out a little bit, and he'd flood it, and he'd pull the shape out. But what I'm saying is he didn't force it because he was so relaxed Yeah. that he wasn't trying to draw a skull. He just, in the end, he's like, it'll be a skull. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, that, that, that's how you get creative, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't know. He was... He was Man, we lost a good one. Yeah, for sure. And that I don't is. even think he full full on knew it at the time. I I, I think he was chasing. He was still very young in his He was young and he was trying to be exposed at the time and he was trying to get his footing as a known artist and and I think he was uh, he was 2 seconds away from being a legend and and then, you know, yeah. tragedy. But yeah, he, if you go back even today and you look at his work, that dude was a master. Yeah, he was. He you know, I've always kind of classified a lot of different airbrush artists, like between like, you can always tell someone that grew up through the t-shirt aspect mm-hmm. and somebody that had a more illustration background. 
So Jaime obviously did t-shirts. Like his, yeah, this t-shirt. He was he had a very smooth flow with his airbrush right. strokes and stuff. T-shirt like that. people are going to be better with uh, hand control. Hand, yeah, exactly. And then you know you got, I mean obviously uh, you know I think that you and 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 Corey and fuck you know Steve mm -hmm. Gibson. A lot of you guys have more of a uh, artsy, fartsy, artsy, illustrated. Yeah. You just have a lot more patience. <laughs> See, I, you I'm say it's patience, it really isn't. I feel no, like no, I'm no. stuck in the middle between like your style of art and Jaime's work. So, Well, patience, I don't believe, is the right answer. Because if it was patience, we'd probably be doing paintings more like Drew Blair or something. But yeah. I think it's we, we come from a, a... We have different taste. Yeah. So like because we don't have a t-shirt background... Well, they might. I don't know. I, I never asked them. But yeah. um, I don't. Uh I was just, we, we have different, I don't know, we, I was trying to make it look like a painting, like a classical, you know. Um, well, you said it to me uh, when we hung out that night at the, at, at the bike shop. You were telling me that, you, you know, when you did your airbrush art, you can achieve the realism of a picture. Right. But, you know. What's the point? What's the point? Like, there's something nice about the way airbrush art looks. I like to let my paint strokes show. Yeah. But I don't like him to be so soft that it looks airbrushed. I don't want. I don't like it to look airbrushed, and I don't like it to look like a photo. Even though some people might look at, say, my noir bike and think that's a photograph. Yeah, I'm like, no, it's not. You know, I mean, yeah, compared to Drew Blair, right? Way I'm different. like, I'm like, no, I now. Granted, I was challenging myself. That was more or less a study of light. Yeah, more than it was. Uh, a study of form or anatomy or anything like that or trying to get it photorealistic it was like really really paying attention to the subtle transitions in shape and form and so like uh, yeah and I don't know I never you know no offense because my best friends are airbrush artists and I respect every one of them I just never was attracted to the look of airbrushing yeah the, the, when, it, when you look at something you're like that was airbrushed yeah I, to me, that was an unattractive um, thing, and I don't know why. Maybe it was because, maybe it stems back to when I was a kid, and my dad painted motorcycles and cars, and I saw it as work. Yeah. Maybe that's where it's rooted. And so, I don't know. So, I was always attracted to, I want it to look like a painting. In fact, even now, people might think that I don't do, like, I, I, I like, oh, he doesn't do realism anymore as much, so he's slacking or something. But the real, the truth of it is, once you've done it, why keep doing it? You know, so now yeah. I'm like, I love my air, my brush strokes to show through. I love when when it looks like, almost impressionistic. It looks like, you know, like a, like an old painting, like oil painting. Yeah. Like where it's got volume and it's. It got some more character. I mean. It, yeah, it's character. You can pick out, and in fact, when you write your name, your signature, you're not thinking about the shape of it for the most part. You you just it is what it is. It's yeah. a natural movement. And so once I've kind of, and that's what I am today, I think, like, I've kind of given myself permission to just move my hand the way that it moves and yeah. let the paint do what it's going to do. And when it does something interesting, I let it be there. Instead of back when I did more realistic stuff, I would make sure everything was flawless. Mm -hmm. Like, if it wasn't freaking perfect, then it wasn't right. Now, if... If something happens in my scribbles and my my natural motion and it looks interesting, I run with that. Yeah. I let it. I let it come through, and so to me, it does. You're right. It does add character. It it, it adds your signature. Now then everyone can look at it and like that's Ryan. You know, yeah. I can tell his because style. he's yeah. the only one that moves his hand like that. And nobody should ever try to mimic the way I move my hand. You know, like. Um, and it, and, I, and I'll admit, I was trying to move my hand like Corey's in the beginning. And the reason is, is because Corey was doing what I was already trying to teach myself to do. Yeah. And I was like, might as well, well is it, pick up where he left off. You know, as an artist, do you think it's not a better idea to, uh, or at least not at some level, um, find artists that you admire and try and You learn? absolutely should. If you're too good to, to admit that, then, I mean, everyone... Is pulling from somebody else, yeah. and if you think you're not, you're a liar, and and yeah, there's you need to work on your inspiration from yeah, you need else. you need to work on that, and just just understand we pull inspiration from everywhere, and acknowledge where you're getting your inspiration from, and be proud of it. You know, yeah. like uh, 
That's true with all forms of li- all parts of life. Like yeah. everything is just a continuation of the things that came before it. You know what I get off of you though that I think is an awesome thing, and I actually say this about the custom paint industry all the time, and why you know the people, the friends that I have in it, why we do well is because. If you were going to consider yourself in competition with Corey St. Clair, it's not a competition for customers. It's just a competition, like a something that you it's, want to be good yeah. as or, you know, whatever. See, I don't even see it that way anymore. I probably did in the beginning because it's the drive that I needed to, to make you to make me get better. to the level. Yeah, yeah but um, I don't look at somebody like, like for instance, my, I think, uh, like right now, like, Corey and Steve are probably most similar to what I do. Yeah. And so, um, Steve Gibson, by the way, if you guys want to look him up, uh, I don't look at either one of those two guys as competition or, uh, I, I think we are all three of us and I'd even throw Charles, even though he's not really yeah. like hanging out with us, but we're all we're all pushing the same boundaries. We're all raising the same bar. Yeah. So I don't look at it like I'm trying to raise my own bar past them. We're all pushing it together. And so when they make a success and it inspires me to have my own success, it's just we're all running the same race. So I don't see it that way. So when Corey does something amazing, I'm floored by it because I'm like, damn. Yeah. I got something new to try out or damn, I need to start working harder. It went, when Steve came on... Um, yeah, he kind of came from left field. Well, well I guess Steve... <laughs> Steve St- I don't know Steve's story because he, he showed up out of nowhere, but apparently he's been around a while. He just was kind of staying low-key. Yeah. And then um, something inspired him to come out and, uh, and show his He has ass. a very, very traditional art background, too. I mean, all yeah. the oil painting stuff he does. And yeah. I mean... I don't... I mean, me and, me and Corey are pretty good friends, but at the same time, like, we don't really get too deep into art philosophy and shit like that so i don't really know how much of a traditional art background he has as compared to you know like what you have and stuff like that uh yeah well i don't know his background but i I, if you talk to him he's very educated yeah um he knows his art history um very well and he always knows his theory very well um i told him at, at sema i was like man like I felt like when you started doing, when you jumped into the lowrider scene and started doing the lowriders, I was like, that's you all day, man. Large scale. Are you talking about Corey? Yeah, Corey. Yeah. He started, man, he was fucking, he was revolutionizing uh, lowriders. Well, lowriders needed it. I mean, they did. You, oh my you, God. You yeah, yeah. It, yeah. You, can't, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over yeah. again. You know, it's like I, we were talking about those tattoo guys that want to stay traditional. You, if you're, people need variety, man. And, Corey was bringing what we were already doing to the lowrider scene and, you know, bless him for it. Like, I think that's awesome. I, I have, you know, I hope to be able to do some lowriders with Corey one day. Um, I'm, my direction's a little different at the moment, but yeah, you need somebody to light a fire under everyone's asses. So everybody can stop fucking living in right now and stop thinking stop that pushing. if you never look past your fucking front porch you're never gonna go anywhere you know you gotta you gotta have somebody to light a fire under your ass and Corey's doing that and he did that for me and um i feel like that's what i was i'm doing with my airbrush work so if i raised the bar and made shit harder for everyone then fucking good for it like i don't i don't i don't like complacency at all i'm very anti-complacency i don't i don't like to see things just continue on the same way yeah it's real hard once you're uh you know, uh, for myself and, you know, I'll be super honest here. Like when I first got into airbrushing, it was, uh, all the people around me that did airbrush work. I feel like I surpassed them within the first year and these Mm -hmm. guys have been doing it forever. Right. I feel like subconsciously, you know, comparing myself to them, which I don't do now. I never do that type of shit now, but I felt like, okay, I'm, I, he, I can do everything he can do. And I think my shit's tighter now. I think my stuff's better now. And then I started looking, who's the next guy right. that's on the level that I need to get to? And you Start know, pushing there. And I started pushing that. And for a while, and then, then, you, then what happened with me is you get to a comfort but you zone. But you got to remember the whole time. And I lost sight of this when I was younger, but I know it now. You getting better than people quickly is not all your victory. Mm-hmm. It's they, they've paved the road for you. Yeah. If not for their successes, you'd have, you wouldn't have that 
place to jump off from. Yeah. So, and I say this to, to like apprentices and stuff today. I'm like, if I'm a good teacher and you're a good apprentice, you should be better than me in two or three years Mm -hmm. because I'm giving you all of my knowledge that you've acquired that I've acquired over my several years and the knowledge that I gained prior to that from other people, all I'm giving you that right now out of the gate. So you, you've, you're starting it with a, you know, ahead of us. So you should be better than me, but at the same time, don't get cocky and think that was your success. You know, that, that was, yes, you deserve it, but don't, don't, don't forget it was a gift. Yeah. You know? And so, you know, throughout that time of, you know, you, I finally got to a point with airbrushing that I felt like uh, I made good money. You know what I mean? Like the jobs I was getting paid to do, it was, it was good money. And so then I plateaued really bad, right? I got a couple little better here and there, here and there, but never like no massive amount of growth like I felt like I had when I started airbrushing. And so, um, you know, it was just kind of like it got to a point where you were just, I was kind of lost. Like, man, like I'm not... I can do this. I know what my shit looks like. But then I started feeling like everything I was doing was coming out the same. I was given the same thing. And I was looking. And that's when things really changed for me from when I loved art. And I used to do paintings. And I had a fucking feature in Lowrider Art Magazine and all mm-hmm. this crazy shit. To I have 20 or 30 canvases up in this attic right now. I got 20 skateboards. I got 20 things that I want to airbrush. But it became a job. You know, I yeah. never, I never quite looked at airbrush again like a, uh, like a release. Yeah, when you do something that you love for money, and for clients, yeah, it'll, uh, it'll wear on you pretty good. That's it wore on me pretty good too. But yeah, when, when it becomes a job, then you shouldn't. If you if you're not as driven as you once were. Then you should start. Um, I mean, you ask yourself like all the things that made you dr- driven from the get go. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, well, I was blazing new trails, man. Yeah, it's it's like an empty vessel, but you know, you can grow jaded, I guess, over time if things don't, um, if there's no room for it to keep filling up. Yeah. I guess. and or you know, for whatever reason, so yeah, you're driven in the beginning because you're you're doing new things, but then you know, you sometimes things get repetitive. And clients get repetitive, and that's when it's easy to grow jaded because you're like, you know, fuck this shit, I'm over yeah. it. And yeah, it's, but that's why you got to keep moving. You yeah, know? you got to stay fluid. I was thinking about this today, actually, and I'm hope I'm not throwing the conversation no, off. Good. But um, what? But you know what? I gotta piss. So <laughs> go for it. I'm listening, dude. No, I want to hear it too. Just, you want to pause? <laughs> Should have kept recording. <laughs> what? You told me to fucking pause it. Well, anyways, we're back now. So, hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, finish that thought. What was the thought? Oh, a fluid. Yeah, plateauing was. and yeah, then yeah, yeah, yeah. being fluid. Um, okay. So, I was thinking about this uh, yesterday morning, actually. Um, and I don't know where it came from, but I was like, man, I guess some people are like a lake. Mm-hmm. Or a pond. A pond is something that stays still and it's comfortable in its small little bubble, right? And it can live that way for a long time and be comfortable. And other people are maybe like a lake, so they like their bubble to be a little bit bigger, like a city, you know, mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, and that's where they find their comfort and their complacency, or th- their happiness, I suppose. Yeah. And then there's other people that are maybe more like an ocean, where that maybe it's a little bit grander. You know, they're happier in their country. They're happier with you know, those types of familiarities. But I, I think there's other people that are like a river, which is I've decided I'm, I'm one of those people where it has to keep moving all the time, mm-hmm. where I'm never going to be happy in the same place doing the same things. It has to constantly be changing. So that's why I don't even paint the same way that I used to. I never paint the same way twice ever. In mm-hmm. fact, I don't even do the same thing on both sides of the tank. Yeah, I, I hate doing that. Yeah, yeah so... And... um that was some profound shit right now. Yeah. Well, no, I, it just came to me yesterday because I was just talking to like somebody the, about it. And it, I'm, I'm, I always think that way. I always think of ways that things relate in other ways. Metaphorically. That, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm a philosophical well, it's, mind. You're well, it's, it, you know what's crazy? Like, uh, you know, artistically, I think when you do art for a living in some kind of way, it's natural for you to think in a more 
in that kind of form. Like you're constantly thinking metaphorically and you're constantly like yeah. looking for meanings of shit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I do the same shit, even yeah, though we all I, do, you know, I, I, sometimes I think a really good ones. I'm like, I'm gonna hit them with this later. Yeah. It's going to fucking work. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, it's a, it's a strange deal, man. It really is. But you, you're, I think artists are more trapped in their mind. So they're constantly, things are firing. We get easily offended too, man. Like what we do is a passion. You know, and I can't speak on other people's jobs, but I, you know, I think there's a lot of people whose job isn't necessarily a passion. It's a, it's a, a, a source of money, and my job happens to also be my passion. So, it's easy to get jaded when other people don't treat you that way, or if things become repetitive, or if like you feel like you're not expressing yourself anymore, and it's starting to feel like work. And when it starts to feel like work, it's no longer what it once was so you have to like be willing to reevaluate i don't like i don't like digging in too deep i used to um and i learned a lot mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm 34 now i've been I, i'm at 10 years now i've been doing this longer which is nothing to a lot of people probably listening but it's a lot to me and um i don't think the same way i'm not chasing some empire i'm not trying to start my own shop and 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 uh conquer my city or whatever i'm trying to keep everything fluid Mm -hmm. like so at any given time if i'm painting a motorcycle and tomorrow i hate painting motorcycles i'm gonna start tattooing somebody and if that next day i hate tattooing somebody i'll i'll probably call Corey up and like hey man you got some lowriders let's go throw down Mm -hmm. you know to keep it moving to keep my you know because like i said if you stay still too long i believe this is true of me you will get jaded and it won't be your client's fault even though you want to blame them i do <laughs> i do <laughs> i do too don't worry <laughs> yeah, I like do. how he snuck that in yeah dude i do <laughs> hey just because i can speak really good doesn't mean i'm not a fuck up too but yeah like um the i mean i do that like clients do shit they you know you, you, clients have deadlines man deadlines are the worst they, because you're you're on the fucking you have to perform every time yeah and you have to show up and you have to show out and you have to win them their trophies and you have to make their deadlines and and all these things and that can like rip you apart yeah and every time especially if you're a people pleaser like me i i i'm so, i'm so bad about it i can't i don't have it in me to like let someone down and when i do yeah. it tears me apart trust me the same way so like same way. Everyone thinks that what you do for a living, if you're doing an art, like whether it be painting motorcycles or cars or tattoos or whatever it might be, they think if you were on one day, you're on every day and you're not. And that pressure can really weigh on you when you don't always hit home runs, man. You're not always going to win. And so. Yeah, I I completely, 100%, 1000% know exactly what you talk about. You know, you're. Sometimes, you know, when you have, you know, like we, we have a high volume of work that we do, right? We're constantly pushing things out. And so we're constantly having to redesign and recreate. Yeah, you have to reinvent the wheel every single day. Yeah. And that gets, it gets tough. And so there's, you know, I get in phases where certain things carry on in certain jobs. So like I get into this little phase where I'm doing this and then that carries in a couple of jobs and then I get over it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I jump into another thing and then. But the thing is, by the time you've, this is what kind of sucks about the tattoo and the uh, uh, motorcycle or whatever it might be. Um, once you've done that thing you are really into, it's out in the world now and it's selling more of those things. So you can't turn it off. Yeah. yeah. It's like, dude, I've already, I'm not doing that anymore. It's, I guess like a band playing their hits over and over. Yeah. I was just telling a customer today. It's like, I, I sandbag a lot of the things I do. You know what I mean? Only because I know that no matter what I do, I'm going to get asked to do it a thousand more times. Right. It's like, so, why didn't you post my motorcycle? Well, it's not that I didn't like it. It's just that I don't want to do it again. I've already done it once. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, for us, I mean, on a, on a huge fortunate level, like, yeah, we can post a picture of a bike we painted and we'll, we'll get required or requests for more. Like, hey, you know, how much for this? How much for that? I like that color scheme. That's the one thing that we have a, not a problem with, but we get trapped in is that we'll do a color scheme and then customers love it. So now four more people want that color scheme. Right. So you, to, everything comes in threes and fours, don't it? Yeah. Yep. So I have to recreate that paint scheme in three or four different ways mm-hmm. and then um, hope that someone is off of that 
that that spectrum and then i get to do something else and that inspires three or four more right you know and, and you're right and some you know sometimes you get those pawn people they really like doing the same thing over and over yeah think of the tattoo guys who like doing roses every day and they like doing traditional and they never come off of it that that's who they are mm-hmm. they're not pushing boundaries they don't care to because this is what they're interested in and you know again if anyone's listening and they do that i'm not saying yeah, it's not offensive. bad it's not bad it's just that's who you are I, you know what the when you came over here today and you started telling me your your kind of concept of how you want to do things it, it's it's so crazy how that's the same thing that we've been you know more or less doing in a different way but still the same type of shit you know just the mm-hmm. traveling because you do feel trapped like there there was it 10 years ago there was this idea like you know we got to build the biggest, baddest custom paint shop there is. And we got to be the guy that everybody... That ain't me. Not me anymore. No. I have no interest in No, it. I have no interest in it either. I would rather not have a shop. Right. I would rather uh, be fluid like you were talking about to where, you know, we have... I love the fact that we have social media so we can create... I, I like human interaction. I right. love social uh, gatherings and events where we're all talking and conversating. That's why I fucking have a podcast. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. it's fun to talk to people. But... You know, when you have a shop, you get stuck in the shop. You get stuck building, you know, that shop in that place and paying this rent and doing that and doing this. And you're in the same place every day. And then you have, you know what I mean? Like you, nothing's changing. And it's so easy to get real complacent and feel like you're trapped in your glorious career that people would die to have, but you're unhappy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, it's It's not fair to do that. And you're gonna the the thing is if if you're doing that it's going to it's going to affect not only your work but it's going to affect the people around you it's going to affect your reputation if you're like some jaded asshole yeah and yeah you got to get philosophical again but like <laughs> no like you, you only have a finite amount of time yeah on this planet and then you're gonna die and and you know if any time that you use alive for something that makes you unhappy is time wasted yeah if you cry over spilled milk those time you're not going to get back you're not going to like i jesse just learned that term today by the way yeah <laughs> no just i didn't just learn that tape i just i knew about he never it. knew about that so what what the, the, the concept milk. of spilled milk because yeah <laughs> thanks for ruining his fucking well you got to learn how to fucking let shit just roll off your back and put yourself in a position where things can't affect you so if you're like for instance let's say you know, you got a shop and that shop is like a million dollar shop and you're always having to perform and you're always having to produce and you always have deadlines. You put yourself in a position to where it's easy to get, to get in that way where you're like, I'm, I'm, I got this huge fucking bill. I got to pay every month. And, um, if I don't make it, I'm not going to make it. And now you don't have time to say no to anything. You don't have time to focus on your happiness because you're always trying to pay your bills. And, and you really don't have the time to grow yourself as an artist. Or no, as because anything. you're chasing this grand thing. You're trying to build an empire that um, you have to ask yourself: Is this empire going to create happiness, or is my happiness something else? You know, or is like some of us or some people I know for a fact, their happiness is building it. And then, and, once, and if that's you, that's once, you. Yeah. Once you get yeah. to the top, then you then know, what do you do then? Yeah. Like, you expand. You build something else. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you see that all the time. People who, you, you know, these billionaires and whatever that build empires or whatever, they, they build multiple ones. Yeah. They don't just build one and stay in it, you know. And, and I'm not an empire builder. I'm an artist. And I'm trying to stay happy. And I'm trying to minimize the things that are going to neg- negatively affect my life. And when I was painting in a shop every day and I had to perform every single day, it, it wore on me. And... Now I'm I'm not trying to put myself in that position anymore. I think the 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 one good thing, all right, if you if you take your story, you know, you plan to go to Hawaii. That was your goal. That was my goal, yeah. So you were doing the work to re- reach the goal that you had, and then the goal fell apart when the work. Um, but at the same time, were you were also giving? Were you also giving the work that you were doing a hundred percent? Oh you- yeah, because I'd found my happiness in the work that I was doing. Yeah. At that time, yeah, it wasn't like. I was chasing Hawaii because I didn't know what else to do with myself. I was like, well, I've... It, it seemed like a... a an well, it was this thing I had had since I was a little kid. I saw a commercial of this dude um, riding a jet ski. Mm-hmm. and Everybody's happy on jet skis. Yeah, and he was riding a jet ski, and it was crystal clear water and yada yada and all this good stuff. And I asked my dad, 
where is that? You know, and my dad said that's Hawaii, most likely. And so it never left my brain from that day. Yeah. And so um, I had to go to Hawaii. Yeah. And I still haven't been, honestly. Yeah. I, I, in fact, I have this thing I paid for, and I haven't gone yet. Um, in fact, they call me every day, like, when are you going to book your thing? I'm like, I'll book it when I book it. Just chill out. <laughs> but, um, no, I still have full intentions on going. And now Hawaii is, it's not what it's not that same thing for me. It's like an accomplishment. I have to do it because I have to do it now. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, what I really was trying to, or trying to emphasize there was that the concept is that you created a goal for yourself. And you took the means in which was around you to get to that goal. Mm-hmm. And instead of just putting 100% of thought into the goal, you put 100% thought in how to make what I'm doing. My goal changed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I was painting, my goal at the, in the beginning, and I hate to admit this because you know people don't like it, but in the beginning, my goal was to be the best. Now I was naive at the time, yeah. and I, I thought that there was. I such think a we thing. were all in that, that yeah, mindset yeah. in the two thousands. You know, I think I mean? anyone young and new in something, and you find out that you're actually pretty good at it, you, you're gonna you're gonna shoot for the stars. Yeah. And so that was it. I, I wanted to be the best, and truthfully, you know, I, I've grown over it. Like. I think I accomplished what I wanted to. I won a bunch of awards. I got in a bunch of magazines. I painted a bunch of bikes that did really well. And I kind of uh, thought to myself, well, well, you did what you meant to do. Yeah, what's and I'm next? not saying I was the best because I'm not at all. So don't think that I'm saying that. But I did what I, you, I, did what I needed for myself. You did exactly what I did, right? I, yeah. I made these imagination goals in life, whether it was the magazine or SEMA or a level of a bike that I want to get on or something I want to do artistically with my ability. And every time you hit them, it's like you have to find the next thing to like put your, you know, how you feel over the top again. Like, like I, you, like you need to keep chasing something. Right? Yeah, you do. And you do need something. That's what I was saying. And, and it's like, for instance, we're, we're getting into, um, we're going to start traveling soon. Um, we're going to get a fifth wheel and live on the road and, and uh, I'm going to tattoo uh, in different cities, I'm going to paint in different cities, and I'm going to live that life because I, I've discovered that that's who I am, mm-hmm. and it's what I need in my life right now. And um, I finally have gotten my career and my skills to a point that I can afford to do it. Yeah. And um, it's time is now, you know. And so I guess I'm back where I was before. Or you know what? Another good thing is though is it like let, let's let's do let's go back again. Hawaii was. A goal right it created a drive to do something and then in that doing you created a whole career right uh that's been very great i mean for, for the level of artists that you've been and all the things that you've accomplished it's great but in doing that it opened up your eyes and door and, and opened up doors and ideas to things that you didn't know you wanted when you were looking at hawaii no i had no idea in fact hawaii was just a thing that was from a commercial yeah yeah, it had no other purpose other than that. So the difference between you and a lot of people is that a lot of people are only looking at Hawaii. They're not looking at what they can do now to make that thing a reality. Well, a lot of people look at things as if... Or they, they don't... Well, I, I don't think... Anytime... If you watch a National Geographic or whatever it might be, and, uh, and, and you see something that you're like, man, I wish I could do that. It doesn't even have to be a destination. It could be a thing that you do. Yeah. Like maybe build a truck or... Uh, maybe build your own house or whatever it might be. Um, the thing that you desire, do it. Just do it. Mm-hmm. The only way to do something is to do it. And and so like me personally, it's travel that inspires me more than anything. I think. And and but you found out that though. I learned that over yeah. time because after traveling a lot, I learned this is this is who I am. It's and every time feeling. I go home, I'd be like, home is just another. Like every time I come home, I'm like. This is just something to get me to my next trip. Yeah. And and sometimes home can be too grand. Like I buy the biggest TV, I buy the coolest truck, I get the nicest house, and all these things to occupy my brain while I'm home when all I really want to do is be on the road. And so like what I found myself doing was digging myself in too deep. Like like now I have to buy the, I have to pay for this house, I have to pay for this truck, I have to pay for this, I have to pay for that and pay for that and now I can't travel. Yeah. So what am I doing? You know, like Travel is what I really, I love life experiences. I love visiting people. I love visiting, you know, I, I love it. I love the experience of being on the road. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great thing, man. It's like, 
I especially like it when it's like Monday or Tuesday. I know everybody else is at work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and you, you get guys. the road to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean that. That's. I think that's what I try to tell people. Or, you know, we were talking about how we sit here as we work. We 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 figure out these metaphoric ways of, of explaining things. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I think I've done that too. And I feel like a lot of people are unhappy with things they do in their life because they're not willing to do things for nothing. Right. Well, maybe if people not are intimidated, no- people are, that's what I was actually, I got sidetracked. The point I was making earlier was people like, for instance, I'll just use myself for example. You don't look at that. Now, granted, I haven't been to Hawaii yet, Yeah. but you don't look at that commercial, that thing you want to do and, and think that you're and be like, well, That'd be nice to go there. Like, no, do it. Do what you want to do. Make things happen. And it, like I said, people listening, if it's, it's probably not travel for you. It's probably building a car or, or remodeling your, your, your landscape or something, whatever it might be. Do it or don't. Like, what's the point in wishing for things? You know, like... I, You're I, an adult. Make yeah, it do it. <laughs> yeah. You only got one fucking chance You're at this. Do you want to be at your deathbed one day thinking about all the things you didn't do? Or do you want to think about the things you did? And and so that's why I look at it like, man, I want to go see, you know, Patagonia. Yeah. Well, I'm going to fucking go. And and I've learned that about myself. Like, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to so set limitations. You know, it, it's so crazy because the last time me and you talked was basically SEMA, right? Right. So me and you sat down. We shot the shit at SEMA. Well, and I'm going to take a bathroom break and we'll okay. get into SEMA. All right. All right. Okay. But uh, you can go ahead. This yeah. is not really about SEMA. So the last time we talked was SEMA and, you know, here we are. Uh, I hit you up. You come to town and we're having this conversation that is exactly on track of what we talk about all the time. But your, you know, his perspective is a little bit different than ours because we, yeah. we put a motorcycle in there. Right. And want to do the travel and the life experience and stuff with that. But he, you know, he's more of an artist, not so much of a, a bike guy or whatever the case may be. And he's on the same fucking page. He yeah, wants the same type of thing. I'm just and sitting here, everything he's been saying, I'm like, like I, I don't want our listeners to think that I prepped him before he came. Yeah, here. I know. I was just sitting here thinking There's like, no holy script fuck. On the table. I yeah. was just, I was just literally just texting Shelby. I was like, dude, this guy is like saying the exact same shit we always talk about. It's a weird thing. I, I, there's something in the water is what it is. I feel like there's something in the water that's making everybody just not want to do this same shit that we were all kind of brought up to do. Like, no, I think it's just everybody is starting to get like realize there's other shit out there because of social media and all but, this you stuff. Know, the, and they're like, holy I, fuck, I got to I really get away. think that there's something important that I hope doesn't get overlooked by people is that you still have to have skills in life, right? Yeah. So I mean, you have to have something to carry you through whatever yeah, you're trying so to do. Yeah, so don't get so hyped up on the idea of travel and those life experiences yeah. and forget to make yourself a skillful person in some form or fashion. Yeah, that like, way you, you can gotta support be able, yourself through You can't city. be the dude that's just jumping on trains and you're literally nothing. you got to be able to, yeah. you know, if you're going to get right. to the town, have something to offer to make money. It's like they always say, it's like the pop- apocalypse ha- happens... Are you going to be useful? Yeah, or are you just going right. to be out in the back? Are you going to be the one that's for somebody, to, somebody to make a useful? fucking fire? Yeah. You reminded me of something else. Um, when I was a kid, I remember my dad telling me, uh, he said, you have to have a trade. It doesn't matter what you learn in life or what you do in life or what you want to do. Just make sure you have a trade before you start. Yeah. And because he, he's like, because if shit hits the fan and things aren't working out, at least you can do your trade. You know, whether it be, and it's something that's got to be useful to the world, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it be building houses or working on cars, painting cars, um, those are just things I do. But if it's landscape, whatever it is, it has to be in demand and make sure you have that in your pocket. So you are useful, like you were saying. And truthfully, I was just recognizing this about myself the other day. And I remembered when my dad told me, I was like, man, I got three trades. I have three things that I do very, very well. I'm good. Yeah, you'll, I'm good. You'll now out. I can do whatever the hell I want because if shit hits the fan, yeah, like like if tattoos don't pan out anymore and painting motorcycles don't work out anymore and airbrushing and all that, I can still paint cars. Yeah, and if we're living in flying spaceships, I'll paint those motherfuckers too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'll be all right. No worries. That's the that's the thing that I want people to understand is that you know, uh, just as important it is to have dreams and want to travel and experience all this shit. You know, 
when you're going home and you get off work and you decide to sit down and watch fucking you know TV or Roseanne or whatever That's the fuck is a new thing, you could be putting you're wasting your life. A hundred percent. Now. What now you I do need you, to unwind. Everybody needs to recharge their batteries. Ago, you shouldn't kill yourself either. I told my brother, like me and my brother both play a lot of video games, but I said, you know what? You have to reward yourself for hard Correct. work yeah. during yeah. the day to play the game. Yeah. See, we're an adult, yep. so if I want to play a and fucking game till I, four in the morning, I will. But I will not do it if I did nothing all day long. I Correct. Have that same There's nothing fucking, more worthless uh, of a feeling than if you just played video games dude, and wasted your Yes, and time. I have that same attitude attitude towards everything I do. Whether it's like if I'm gonna go out and drink that night, I'm gonna make sure that I fucking worked hard enough to go deserve. You have those to drinks. earn it. That's you know something I, mean? I don't. I think you get that and with if, age, man. If yeah. I don't feel like I earned it, then I'm gonna do it, and I'm just gonna sit there and be if, mad as fuck at myself. You're gonna like, hit yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Dude, yeah. Now when I go get drunk and I get wasted and I wake up with a hangover, I'm all right with it. Yeah. When I was in my 20s i deserve this hangover yeah <laughs> what, no when i when i was in my 20s and i do the same thing i'd be like i'm a piece of shit because i didn't do this and i didn't do that yeah. you know and, and like I, I would have this extreme guilt i don't have that anymore yeah yeah that's me i get the guilt yeah you if you're doing something and that's hard the guilt is hard to surpass until you finally find your footing yeah you know like i feel like i've finally found my footing it took me a long time to find it but man the come up is hard yeah Mm-hmm. It's you know, and that's why that's why that old saying is really important. You got to learn in your twenties, yeah. earn in your thirties, and live in your forties. Right now, I think that we we have a, an inherent hustle in our gene pool now, to where we can learn in our early twenties, yeah. earn in our late twenties, and start really living in our fucking thirties. Well, you got to yeah, you're conscious of it, man. You got to think about that shit. And like you know, you got to be concerned about your happiness. And I think what happens, you start watching people around you kind of fall off. Yeah. You, know? you see your you see your family members die, and you see people you loved go away or, or, or get depressed or off themselves. You mm-hmm. know, like and you see these things happen, and you have to reevaluate your purpose here or what you know. You have to you have to be willing to be like, man. You know, it's like so, we we've been talking about moving to California. Uh, something we bring up a lot on this cal- this podcast and. You know, we get a lot of people talking about this, that, and the other. Like, oh, man, you know, it's super expensive here. And I said, you know, me and Jesse both came up with the same deal. And it's like, you know, I would rather struggle somewhere I want to be than struggle in another way somewhere where I can afford to be. Yeah. And at the same time, you got to be willing to ask yourself, is where you are the the issue or is it something else? Like, um, it's that whole superficial thing. It's yeah. kind of like buying a TV yeah. because you're bored one day. Yeah, I got I was, money. I in, almost bought one earlier. I yeah. Well, no, it's true, and I Swear. do it. All, no, I do it all the time. Fucking three hundred bucks for a fifty inch now, yeah. dude. <laughs> no, 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 like I do it all the time, but I recognize I've learned from it because I started looking around my house and I'm like, that yeah, fucking TV. What the fuck do I need that for? It, it was because I was bored one day. Yeah. yeah. One day. That's how I end up buying stupid ass video games. Yeah, and yeah. and what it's a superficial, short term fucking high. It's like doing a drug, yeah. you know, and it's like, like you have to, shit. yeah, you, and yeah. then you have to ask yourself, what is really important to me, you know, and, and, you know, if it's watching TV, then more power to you, watch the fucking TV, but yeah. if we need those guys, yeah, yeah, somebody's got, yeah. somebody's got to lose so we can win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's the American dream. Yeah. Man. But I'm just saying, if you find yourself filling your life with a bunch of things, mm that are trying to cure your boredom, boredom yeah distract yeah whatever it might be your unhappy evaluate where your true happiness comes from for some people it's fishing for some people it's you know whatever but um, i think for a lot of people it's just purpose like yeah, yeah. having something that makes them feel purposeful and and this goes back to like a Joe Rogan pod, a mini Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah, a lot but of them. <laughs> I kind of came up with this concept because my you know my wife does hair, you know, she's not super happy with it. She feels like she's in a job that you know, it's just not going anywhere. But one thing I will say for people that are in situations they're not exactly happy in, for one, you got to ask yourself, did you take on a part of it that was more responsibility, you know, to make you feel like you give you more purpose in what your job is? Like a lot of people will work in a job, but they don't want the manager position or they don't want to go for that position because, because getting, they don't want the responsibility or well, there's no just more lazy. money. You can't fix lazy. Man. Exactly. But now think about that. It's the same as like when me and you were just talking about our airbrushing and our our artistic background where we made these goals. Those goals didn't necessarily, they didn't, some of them paid more, but some of them are just goals. Oh, you want to talk about goals. So when you set yourself goals, even if it's something you don't want to do, 
like a job that you don't like. Like say you work at Walmart and you're a cashier and you want to be a manager. Well, fucking go be a manager. It'll give you a sense of purpose in what you're doing and make you do a better job at what you're doing. I've, well, I'll tell you another thing I learned. And airbrushing taught me this more than anything. Now, I, I was probably told by a bunch of people, but I learned best by experience. But when I got into airbrushing, after I got over the Hawaii thing and I decided I wanted to be the best airbrusher, mm-hmm. um, more realistically, I just wanted to... I went to an airbrush getaway in um, Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And I took... Cause, well, let me finish the story about when I got into Corey's artwork. Mm-hmm. So we're going to backpedal. <laughs> um, when I got into Corey's artwork... I saw that Corey was going to be teaching a class in Las Vegas. It was his second class. I was, it was during his first one, but I was too late to sign up to his first one. So I signed up for his second one because I saw somebody that had something I wanted and I was going to go for it. You know? Yeah. And so I, you know, and I was painting every day. I was already painting for clients, you know, never yeah. had a lesson in my life. And, um, um, I finally went and I could not wait to go to this class because I felt like I wanted I wanted that knowledge. Yeah. And so I showed up and I learned so much in the first 10 minutes. Cuz I was an empty vessel, man. Any piece of knowledge, you, you know? didn't bring any ego to that that fucking class. No, right. no, I didn't have any room to have ego. Yeah. I was an idiot kid. I didn't know what I was I barely knew how to airbrush, you know. I didn't there was no room for ego. But I learned so much from that first class that I was just like, I went from nobody to people paying attention to me literally overnight Mm -hmm. because of going to this class. And, um, and it wasn't even the full class. It was, it was almost like I I compare it to like Highlander. Yeah. You know, like, you know, all he has to do is chop someone's head off and he gets all their fucking power. Yeah. I felt like it was that easy. Like, all I got to do is show up, and I just learned everything. Like, I know everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, you were a sponge to it. Yeah. yeah, I was just a total sponge. You, you know? know, the cra- you know, not to take you away from that, but, and I'll be honest, when I went to my first airbrush getaway, I went into it fully egoed. I, uh-huh. I hate myself for it because, not that I thought I was better than anybody by any means, but I walked in there like, I'm an accomplished painter. What are you trying to show off? Like, anyone was going to be impressed? <laughs> it, it was an ego thing, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, it, and for me, it was bad because, and I hated. You know, I, I made a good friend out of it. Me and Darren Winslow are great friends yeah. now, um, and some other people. Like, I, I got to know people that I've always admired, but I think that's the only thing I wanted to do. Like, I wanted to be in the crowd. I want to be in the group of all the airbrush and custom right. painter guys. So I went to the getaway for the wrong reason. Right. I should have went because you know. I could have learned from Jonathan Panel- Panelton. Is that Pantelion. Pantelion. Or Pantelion. I don't know how to say it. Super fancy. So I could have learned so much great things from him because I admire his work, you know. And I ended up making, you know, great time. But like I said, I went in there more interested to let these guys know who I was rather than learn from them. And I hate myself. I'll, I'll, I'll admit there was a piece of me that was doing that too. But also what I saw is a way to take advantage of all this free information. Mm-hmm. Even though I paid to be there, yeah. I wasn't just there for Corey's <clears throat> class. Yeah, I was going over to Javier's class, and I was sneaking over his shoulder. And I told myself, probably while, you know, on the flight there, I'm not going to be embarrassed to say or do anything. In fact, I still do this today. I'd rather play dumb mm-hmm. so I can get your version of the answer than act like I know everything to try to impress you. I'd rather pretend I don't know shit. So if somebody's like, um, don't you know this already? I'm like, no. Yeah, I do, but I want to hear your version of it. Yeah. Yeah, and so like I went into it like almost greedy. Like I was looking around at everybody there like I'm going to fucking take everything you know, you know? <laughs> I mean, I mean th- that's just kind of it was like kid in a candy store yeah. of knowledge, you know, and and so like um that's what my first experience was, but I will tell you what that did for me though, as far as goals are concerned. I was so jealous of this thing they had you know it's like look at all these instructors look at all these inspiring people people that inspire me and they're sharing all of their knowledge with all these people who are thankful for it yeah right and i was like i want to do that i want to do i didn't even know i wanted to do it until i saw it in real life and i was like i want to do that i want to be the person that helps other people and that are in my shoes right so i 
saw this almost this fraternity of extremely talented people and I wanted to be part of that exactly my, my exact yeah. same thing yeah I felt like and I was I was jealous like you said I was jealous and I was confused as to all the success I've had in my painting career why am I not in that group yeah and instead of, and, and I feel like that, well, was that a, it, it's such a silly thing if you think silly, about yeah. it but if you look at Goals, for instance. Yeah. Let's go back to goals because I want to say this for the listeners that, you know, the value of setting goals. The first time I, when I was on the way home from that thing, I was like, I want to do that. Because when I was doing tattoos originally, I was told that you weren't going to be great until you've been doing it for 15, 20 years, mm-hmm. right? Like me. Well, I've been doing 15, 20 years, so fucking buckle up. Yeah. I was like, I went home thinking, I want to be great tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to do what Corey's doing and what Steve is doing, Steve Driscoll, and what um, Javier is doing. I want to be able to do it tomorrow. Yeah. And um, I was impatient. And so I set a realistic goal for myself. I was like, okay, you're not going to be as good as them tomorrow. You're not going to be good as them next year. But you're 25 now. And it looks like everyone there is at least in their 30s. So let's see if you can do it by 30. Yeah. And I, I, I said it out loud. And it was not because I watched some inspirational shit. Right? I just you did. You watching Tony Robbins? No, I wasn't. <laughs> I really did. Oprah. I only heard about this. I only heard about this afterward. Yeah. And so like, I was just like, I'm going to do this. And I didn't think I might. I'll try. Mm-hmm. I'm motherfucking going to do this. Yeah. And I don't know why I just had that attitude. So when I went home, I took that attitude with me and every painting that I did I was on a mission yeah every fucking one and I wanted people to notice me I wanted to be qualified to be among the people that I had a lot of respect for and so for years I was killing I was just every time I was trying to push the envelope Mm -hmm. every time and it was right before I turned 30 I think I was 29 and there was a competition um, called, it was a... Uh, the American Express one? No, it was before that. It was the Ultimate Brush Off competition. Mm. And uh, who hosted that? Was it Airbrush Action? Or it was, was it? Well, the Ultimate Brush Off was its own thing, but mm-hmm. it was supported by Air- everybody. You know, Iwata, Airbrush Action, Createx, all those guys. And uh, anyway, I had already entered a competition before. And I, I entered it prematurely. It was right when I got home after the fucking yeah. getaway and I lost. And I sent my panel to Steve Driscoll to ask him you know, what he thought of it. And the thing is, is he pointed out all my mistakes. Two seconds. Mm-hmm. I, well, actually, I sent a picture of it to him. And, and so I was like, and I knew those mistakes were there. I just didn't know how skillful the eyes were that were looking at it. So... I told myself I'm not going to do another competition again until I feel like I'm ready. And so this competition came up and um, I did the competition. I, I, I did my painting and I knew at the time all of the points to hit. Mm-hmm. Right. I knew you have to put color in there and, and show off your color. You have to show off your detail. You have to show off your lighting. You have to show up, show off uh, you the quality of your hand control, which I didn't have very good hand control but i knew how to fake it really Mm -hmm. good so um you have to show that you're capable of using candy colors and special effects and things like that and so i just found this idea and i did all of the things i knew would hit Mm -hmm. and um your versatility i guess and i entered it and then kind of forgot about it after a while then i went to sema because part of my goal was to go to SEMA mm-hmm. and, and, and you know meet people, network. And so I went to SEMA my first time. I was 29. And um, I got there, and I was real nervous. And I only knew one person there. Um, and he and I both were real nervous. And I didn't know anybody, and I didn't, you know, whatever. So I was in the Iwata booth, and... Um, kind of like shy to say hi to anyone you know yeah and 
I'm walking around, I got my badge on, and I remember it was, um, um, oh, shit, what's his name? Um, starts with P, Pastrana, Alan Pastrana. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I walk up, and I'm just kind of mingling, and Alan Pastrana, he's the first person I got the guts to say hi to, right? Yeah. And then he notices my name tag, and he goes, you Ryan Townsend? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I was already doing um, my YouTube channel and everything by this time, but I knew they didn't know me from that because why would they look at that? But because um, <laughs> why would they look at that? Yeah, well, they not, might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah, you never anyway, know. Um, he goes, "You're Ryan Townsend." And I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "Oh man, it's so good to meet you." Whatever, whatever. And I'm like, "What? How the fuck do you know who I am?" And he goes, "Dude, congratulations, man." And I was like, "On what?" And he was like. You don't know? I was like, no. He goes, dude, you won the ultimate brush off. I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. How do you not know this? I was like, I don't know. I don't. I didn't, you're the first one to tell me. Oh man, you gotta come here. And he takes me around the corner, and there's my painting, a, you know, a reproduction of it, yeah. up on this big wall at the Iwata booth. The thing I was nervous to even walk up to because all my idols were in there. Yeah. Right. And not only. Did I get a good response? But my painting was up in the motherfucker. Yeah. And it was just like the coolest fucking feeling I'd ever gotten. And what's funny is I was get I was I had food poisoning at the time. So like it mushrooms was, or food poisoning? Mushrooms. No, no, actual food poisoning. <laughs> okay. Uh well, before we got on the plane I had some bad shrimp. But um shrimp. Anyway, uh <laughs> so I'm sitting there, my stomach's rumbling and everything, and I'm just like Oh my God, like I won, you know? And immediately they start putting microphones and shit on me to interview me for the, uh, you know, for the, for the, the I can't uh, talk right now. I got to shit to your right back. <laughs> shit. I, I'd already I sh- really got to go. Shit. I, already sh- I already shit so many times by that point. Like I was already, it was, oh, it was, she was coming out of my fucking throat and my ass. It was oh, just, man. yeah, it was not good. <laughs> That's gnarly. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, they were micing you up. Yeah. They were micing me up and, and, uh, you know, sweat pouring down my head from both being nervous and fucking food poisoning. And uh, he interviews me, and the next thing I know, everybody's shaking my hand. Everyone wants to meet me and everything. And, and um, people are people know who I am. And at the time, you know, one of my biggest think idols at the time, you know, since I was a kid, because my dad was a big fan, was uh, Craig Frazier. Mm-hmm. And even Craig Frazier comes by to say hi to me. Hey, you're the guy that did that painting, right? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, man, that's really good. Will you will you be in my um, art show? And I was just like, I can't believe all the, yeah. these things that are happening. And, it, and and this was my first time to SEMA, so I didn't... I, it was just a, it was a waterfall of like... Good things, good Yeah, vibes. good things. And this was my first time at SEMA. I was going to feel lucky if I just got to even... Like meet some people. Even say hi to somebody. Yeah. yeah. And I was getting all of this you know praise i suppose and i don't know the thing that was that i really took from it more than anything i was 29 i was almost 30 mm-hmm. my birthday's in january this was in october and i met it i did it yeah, yeah you made i'm almost emotional talking about it major goal yeah like i did it i yeah. did exactly what the fuck i wanted because i got magazines after that i got everything happened yeah and I got, and I even got a stamp on it. Here's your trophy to go along with it, you know. And so, here's your cherry on top. Yeah. No, you you said something at the be- beginning of this uh, this this part of this conversation that that I wanted to touch bases on for a lot of people to listen. You know, is that uh, you sent a picture or, or a picture of your artwork to somebody. Now you said something when you said that. You go, you knew all the flaws that were in it. You oh, the, the first one. The yeah, first one, yeah. You knew the flaws that were in it. Right. You wanted to see if he noticed them. Now, right. think about that. Because everything we do in life, we know the flaws in everything we do. It, no matter what the job is. Whether it's, you know, if you're in the paint and body business, if it's the sanding, if it's the this, if it's the that. Or if you're in the bike building or you're a welder. Or all that stuff. Like, you know the flaws. The difference between being great is addressing those flaws and fixing those flaws before you say it's done and i think that that's what you did on your painting oh yeah that one is that you you knew the flaws were there mm-hmm. and you needed to 
needed somebody of some stature in the industry to tell you that those flaws were there, that you already knew they were there. Right. And you went back and you did it right. So I would know that, and you, you could, you could you even, you had the eye for the, you flaws. could even say it was that, that kind of created the beast that I became after yeah. that, because, um, I wanted to make sure that nobody ever saw a flaw in my work after that. That's what led to the motorcycle we ta- started off with. Yeah. The, um, the one the that, one. yeah, I wanted to make sure that not only was it flawless at a distance, but it was flawless under a microscope. Mm-hmm. And maybe it was from that, honestly. Now, I don't think I hold that mentality anymore because I find beauty in my flaws. But at that time, um, yeah. Well, what I'm saying about that thing is I think that that is the one thing that separates professionals from amateurs 100 percent. there are a lot of talented people and i'm not talking about airbrush artists i'm not talking about that i'm just talking about people in their everyday jobs no matter what you're doing if it's a especially if it's a trade if it's a trade that means that you're doing something with your hands and there is a level of completion Mm -hmm. right you know whatever you're doing as a trade if you're a house painter a carpenter an hvac a plumber a cosmetologist no matter what you're doing, there is a level of flaw in everything you're doing. So the difference between you just being a tradesman and you being a professional is the amount of flaws that are left over at the end of the job. Well, you also have to be realistic. I think this is where people can uh, um, slit their own throats. And yeah. I've seen this happen a million times. <clears throat> where if your quality is going to be at the level of flawless that we strive to be, you got to price it that way. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah, you're you going to have, starve. You have to have the time and the... And if, I'm, if anyone's listening and you're a, you're a client, you got to respect that. You came to that person for a reason. Mm-hmm. There's a reason you chose that person. So you need to respect their prices. Yeah, and, so if you start talking them down and shit, then... Or, just... or try, to, try to get their prices down and talk about the guy down the street or, or whatever it might be. It's... It's insulting. We're not in the business of production. We're not in the business. You know, I'm not making hats on an assembly line. Okay. I'm creating yeah. an original piece of art and it's the art that wins the awards that you're after to, to begin with. Okay. Yeah. And it takes so much more effort. You know, it's not because I'm more skillful. It's not because I'm better than anyone. It's because I'm putting an extra love into it. Yeah. And that love costs money, man. And it's time and your time has got to be worth money. It's got to be. So you can't bitch. If, you know, we talked about Tom earlier. We were talking about how, you know, being a river instead of an ocean and, and yeah. stuff like that. That's That means that, you know, essentially you're selling your time for, for this job. And, you yeah, know, so the these amount people... of time that you're going to put in for it to be flawless and to be what people expect of your name, mm-hmm. they have to be willing to pay it. If yeah. they aren't, there are plenty of people that can give you a cheaper version of this. Right. You know? And I think I even recognize, you got to recognize about yourself. Are you the person that's going to put that in? Or, or are you not? You know, if you think it's too time consuming to be professional or, perf- or perfect every time, you need to adjust your prices, man. You know, some people can get. F- yeah, be cheaper. Yeah, well, you can be efficient. I mean, you can over time. I think you have to find a good balance between the price that, that you're putting out for yourself to do work and then the volume of work you're actually producing right. at one you know, amount of time. It's like you can't do. If, you're, if you have 10 things to fucking do. And they need to be done within, you know, a short time period. You can't expect yourself to be able to do flawless on every 10 things, you know. Especially, you can't. Yeah. You, actually, to be on that level 100% of the time is unsustainable. Yeah, it, yeah. it has to be like, okay, this right here, they're paying this much money, so this is what we're going to make flawless. Everything else is going to have to fucking, well, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, everything's it gets checks like that, and balances with there, shit. There becomes a hard part where... You don't want to. Uh, you don't want to offer anything less than the best you have, right? Right. You, you, like you, you don't want to, in theory. You don't want to be Mako. You don't want to have three no. tiers of the work that you offer. But realistically, if say for instance somebody wants you to do a chopper tank, and what they want for you to do your best of your ability is five grand, uh, might be higher. And, right. and I think if you're not and that then, person that can, if if. Like, for instance, I know what I know about myself. I am not that person. Yeah. Now, have I done it in the past? And probably some of my clients are listening. Have I shot you lowball prices and and all that? Yeah. But I have made a decision officially. Mm -hmm. I will not do those again Mm -hmm. because it's emotionally draining for me to try to, 
meet a lower standard because of the price Mm -hmm. or it's emotionally draining for me to meet a high standard at an affordable price. Right. And so honestly, that's the reason I got into tattoos because for tattoos, I charge by the hour while you're on my, while you're sitting in my tattoo chair. Right. So yeah, you never get your hours while you're holding an airbrush. You get the no. price you quote. Yeah. In. So whether it's yeah, whether four hundred hours or four hours, yeah, that you're goes still getting anything in the paint industry though. I mean, if it's like when you're doing custom shit, it's like well, with tattoos you have a flat rate. It's like this is how much I cost for the time that you're right. sitting in my chair, and I will give you one hundred percent of myself. Right. For the time that you're sitting in my chair, but when yeah. you get up and you walk out the door, I'm off to other things because. I needed that balance in my life yeah. because if I was going to say, for instance, do a bike that was a hundred percent of myself and then do two or three bikes that was about 75% that was emotionally draining for me. Right. I couldn't do it. And now some people can, and some people have found efficiency where they can do things more assembly line or efficient See, or whatever. And that, I'm just not that person. We're trying to find that balance right now with our own shit is because it's like, we have such a high fucking volume of work coming in at, like all the time. But we also have such a high standard that we've set for ourselves, right. and we just stress ourselves the fuck you, out. You will. You know what I mean? And you it's will. like. Now, you could also be more <laughs> picky, you know, and this is a harder road because there's less of these people around. But somebody who's willing to pay the money for. So if you did, for instance, one big job yeah. that costs the same as three See, small jobs. We, we tried that with like the whole bagger thing, which that was kind of what we were like striving for was to, okay, this dude wants us to paint a bagger and we'll get. You know, uh, say we'll get you know a month X amount of dollars. Yeah, X amount of dollars, and we'll give ourselves a month just to work on this, well, just to work on. The you paint. have to stretch that money, and it, it almost seems and like that's you why need supplemental money. Exactly. You need, but again, that's why I chose personally tattoos. Yeah. Um, because to me, I didn't have to sacrifice my airbrush work uh, for the attention I was putting in tattoos. Now, what I did find though is I know I thought I was going to be able to balance both. Right, but it's perfect. Damn, near and impossible. no, the answer is no. Yeah. So, what I was doing is I was trying to, I was trying to go home and airbrush, and then go to work and tattoo, and it was just draining for me and 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 depressing almost. Uh, and I again going back to like time spent upset is time wasted. Yeah. Well, if I'm stressed out because I'm trying to please everybody. Yeah. Because I'm trying to stretch myself too thin. It's time wasted. So I had to make a decision, and so I cut off doing work for clients personally. Now, mm-hmm. um, the, uh, airbrush work for clients. Now, right. I still will do it, and I'm going to do my own fine art, and I'll do it selectively. But I've found for myself, and now I'm not speaking for anyone else. I'm just speaking for me. Um, you found your happiness in it. Yeah, I found out I'm much happier when I tattoo nine to five or whatever the, the time no, is yeah. I put in the day, and then I go home. And I unwind. I can have fun with my cats. I can, you know, spend time with my girlfriend. I can watch Thor Ragnarok or play video games and feel guilt free. Yeah. Yeah. Like you don't feel like you have to fucking hustle and grind twenty four seven. No. Yeah. No. The, or, or feel like you should be doing something else while yeah. you're sitting there, here. The, that that emotion was that so straining for me. Sucks. In fact, I can't. It, it's. I always compared it to being. Um, you know, buried in a hole where the more you dig, the deeper the hole gets. You know, like. It doesn't matter how vigorously I try to dig myself out of this hole. I'm just getting deeper and deeper in yeah. it. And um, that, for a lot of time, was killing me. Yeah. And I made a decision to, to cut that out. And I'm much happier now. So when, when, you, when you made that decision and you transferred from doing uh, mainly airbrush work and stuff like that and you went... I remember when you and Faith took the trip to California and you did a full apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. What was that like going through all that shit, you know? Well, there was something that happened in the um, motorcycle business. And if you're in the motorcycle business, there's a lot of overhead. Um, there's a lot of dependency on um, things that you have no control on, mm-hmm. whether it be, you know, you know, getting something cleared flawlessly or, you know, a speck of dirt falling in your artwork or spilling lack of thinner on something and yeah. ruining it. There's so many things that go into it. It's temperamental. It's a yeah. very delicate thing. Okay. And something happened and it was a deadline issue where the client had promised 
this car to be at this show in California. Mm -hmm. And something happened with the shop where we had to move out. Mm -hmm. It was something with the, with the um, landlord in the city. And we had to be out within a couple days. And um, actually, we had to be out that evening. Yeah. But that was impossible. Yeah. Um, and so and it was because the city was beefing with the landlord. And so uh, we, I, 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 the client showed up that same day after that happened t- 20 minutes later. And I told the client, I was like, hey, this happened. And we got to get out of here. And she just sobbed, storied me. But Ryan, we promised, we promised it was going to be mm-hmm. ready. And I love this client, by the way. So if she's listening, I love you. You're awesome. It just, it was just something that happened at the time that was out just, of your control. Yeah, and um, I felt the gravity of having to do it. So I ended up finishing the job while everybody moved the shop around me. And I sat there. If you had a time lapse camera, you would have seen me in front of an easel painting while an entire body shop got moved from around me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I never That probably moved. would have been a badass yeah, YouTube that video. Yeah, would have been a really yeah. cool Probably would have been the highest viewed one ever. Yeah. Just <laughs> so um, I got it done. She made her deadline. And I was so emotionally drained that I felt numb. And I don't know if anyone listening has ever felt this before where – when you're laying in bed and you just feel like you're sinking deeper into it, like it's just like the weight, you're like you're so heavy that you're just. You gave her so much out of you that you really yeah. had nothing left to. Yeah, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep trying to make these deadlines and. Pleasing everybody else. Trying to make everybody yeah. happy and trying and to perform by, by at the highest that, though, level. Just to be clear with everybody listening, when you're, when you're saying pleasing everybody else and to make everybody else happy... I'm not even doing not, it for money. You're not saying that in a way that they're evil fucking... No, no, know. no, no. These clients are great people. In fact, this particular client is one of my favorite yeah. clients ever. It's just that the nature of the circumstance of having to try to please and meet deadlines, it puts a strain on artists mm-hmm. that you know, can have you at the lowest point. And then, I mean, the only way you get to the highest point is like, like when you went to SEMA and your artwork was sitting there on the, on the fucking right. deal. But that's, yeah, those are short victories. And you know what? So I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I decided I was going to, I need to get a normal job. Mm-hmm. I need, I need stability in my life. I can't keep chasing this. You know, it's, it's wearing me out. So a normal job turned into another trade. <laughs> it did. It did. So I went home with this depressing feeling that I was going to have to go get a job on the line. Yeah. Uh, painting cars at a, at a body shop. Yeah. And just to, so I could have that supplemental income because I knew I wasn't the kind of guy to do yeah. high volume work. So anyway, so I went home and I, I went to bed and I woke up the next day, you know, thinking and I was like, you know what? Fuck this. You need to start tattooing. You need a second thing. You've got all your eggs in one basket, and you need to tattoo. But the thing is, is I told myself, I can't just dabble. Mm-hmm. I can't just try. It's not in your nature. Yeah. No. I was like, you need to tattoo, and you need to be good at it, and you need to be good at it yesterday. So this goes back to the goal thing. I understood what the value of a goal was now, right? So I made a decision right there. And I was like, I'm going to learn how to tattoo and I'm going to get good at it. Like, I'm not going to get mediocre. I'm going to get fucking good. I've always told him and everybody around me growing up that, that's been around me, I've always said, no matter what I do, no matter what, if not in an arrogant way, but I'm always going to try to be the best mm-hmm. there is at that. Whatever and, that version is. To yeah. You. Yeah. So if I'm not going to, you know, in trying to be the best at it, that means I'm putting 110% into anything that I do, right. which is why... I've been successful in my life at things I've done. That maybe that's why this podcast has been doing so well because you're pouring not, yourself into I'm it. I'm not giving it ten percent of my, my attention or my uh effort. I'm putting a hundred and ten percent and mad because I don't have another thirty percent to throw into it. Right. You know no, I mean? you're putting a hundred percent. And I knew in that moment, if I'm gonna do this, then airbrush is gonna have to take a back seat. Yeah. And so um and it's not because I wanted to leave airbrushing. It's because I wanted to have two things. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be able to do one and the other. 
So if one gets bad, I got this other one in my pocket too. I'm fine. And you're still, it's still a creative outlet. Right. So, um, and it just happened to be that Faith and I were, um, I was going to her house and we passed a um, billboard on the way that said that there was a, a, a tattoo convention coming in a couple days or the next day or something. It was very soon. And um, so we went to the convention with the purpose of, I just wanted to see what tattoos were up to. Yeah, see where it went. Yeah, I just wanted to know what, what's going on, tattoos. I, don't, I'm never, I, haven't, I haven't been paying attention in a while. <laughs> what's going on, tattoos? <laughs> yeah, so uh, so anyway, I, I went there, and um, hopefully people are still listening. I'm probably telling too many stories. But no, anyway. No, they, they like the long ones. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so I go to just the... Like uh, um, <laughs> I go to the tattoo... Con- I can do this all night. Anyway, I go to the tattoo convention, and I'm just looking for something to impress me, right? Yeah. And not seen a lot, to be honest. It's Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, there's some badasses in Oklahoma. Just, yeah, there they're is. few I'm and far. Like, I'm just fucking with Oklahoma. There's not a lot, yeah. But anyway, so I at this particular show, I wasn't seeing too many things at the time. And so Faith and I were, were, were like starting to wind down and getting ready to bounce out of there. And on the way out, I see this painting on a table. And I know that it's airbrushed, <clears> but I'm not for certain. And so I was like, hey, who painted this? And the guy walks up to me. He's like, I painted that. I was like, oh, what'd you use? And he goes, oh, I use this thing called an airbrush. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, uh, oh, yeah, 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 I know about airbrush. Yeah. I, I actually, I airbrush myself. I just wanted to make sure I didn't want to make any assumptions. And he's like, oh, cool, cool. And we got to talking for a minute. And um, uh, he asked to see my work. And, and I told him who I was. And he been familiar with my work and he was like oh shit that's you and i was like yeah he goes damn man you know and he's talking about that same bike that we started off about yeah and the noir bike and um i was like yeah yeah that was me and um we were chatting and i was like yeah i'm actually thinking about getting into tattoos man and he was like oh yeah well i'd be willing to apprentice you i just got all this shit going on you know i, I you know not right now maybe in a year or whatever and i'm thinking back in my mind no i want to do this right now yeah you know i'm not waiting a year yeah, nobody has a year. And I want you to teach me because you're a badass tattooer and you're a badass airbrusher. So we're going to have something in common. Have something in common. And so um, and this is my this is only two days after my decision, you know. And, and so I. Um, if it takes more than two days for you to act on your decision, then that decision will get lost. It yeah. does. I, oh, I, when I act, once, I, once I'm in, I'm all in. Yeah. And so anyway, so I, I told him what I wanted to do and we talked and. And. Um, Anyway, so he went back to his life, and, and I went back to my, how in the fuck am I going to get into this, right? And so I told him, I was like, well, can I at least ask you, I'm going to teach myself then. Yeah. And can I at least ask you questions, and will you answer them for me? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so I was calling him, and I was tattooing my buddy who would let me fuck up on him. Now, I already knew about, I already yeah. apprenticed before. Already yeah, I'm not green. Him. You know, so I'm like, I'm fucking up. And I, I mean, I'm doing good tattoos, but not as good as I think I should be doing. And... Um, so I finally call him one day. I was like, and he's telling me about, oh, well, I got this going on and that going on and whatever. I'm like, dude, how about this? Can I just drive to California and can I just look over your shoulder? I mean, I guess. I mean, because he don't have time to apprentice me, but you got time to just not change anything about your life and let me look over your shoulder. <laughs> let me fucking follow you around and shit. Yeah, man. yeah. And so he was like, uh, um, I mean, I guess if you want to do that. And so my girlfriend and I, we put all of our shit which was nothing into our car her car and um we drove to california and um it started off he had me he had a because he's a he's an airbrusher so he had a shop behind his his little studio a little private studio and um it was just a little box man it was a little closet and you know of a studio and uh, behind it he had a, a painting area and we put up an inflatable mattress and uh were sleeping on the inflatable mattress and then during the day I would go and watch him tattoo and we just lived there in his yeah. garage basically cool. his shop yeah. for a few days and then finally he was like after he got to know me he's like hey man why don't you just come crash on my couch at home yeah and I was like cool that's better than crashing yeah in here on an inflatable mattress in your in your uh, paint shop so um we went to uh his house and started crashing on his couch and every day I'd go to his shop and I'd lean over his shoulder and I'd ask him questions and 
uh, we'd talk art, but, you know, and, and I was made sure he was, I asked only the technical questions more or less, you know, what happens when a needle punctures a skin? Why does the ink leave the needle? Why does, what, what's the depth and why, you know, I knew how to ask the right questions. So, um, well, yeah, there's enough information out there if you just search. Right. So you, you're going to get enough information that when you get to him, you're going to ask the right questions. I was asking the right ones, and yeah. I would just study and study, and I was very humble, and I was very, you know, whatever. And I was a little scared of my hand control, but I wasn't as scared as I once was. Like, when I learned how airbrushing taught me the value of confidence, you know? And so I was like, well, I'm probably going to suck, but that won't last long. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to make... It work, whatever I have to do, you know. And um, anyway, so I stayed with him for you know three months, and then finally we started air, we started tattooing. I was asking people on the internet if I could fuck him up. Yeah. And uh, a few people let me. <laughs> I would have let you. I don't care. Yeah. And, I don't uh, care. It would uh, match all my other Defile ones. my temple. <laughs> and so um, uh, he got me a really good head start and I learned through him and then um uh when I had to go home because we ran out of money and everything uh they were asking me to stay there in California I was like no I gotta go home because my thing was if shit hit the fan I wanted to have a quick retreat Mm. so if I was in Oklahoma um if I had to move into my dad's house I could quickly do that yeah and so um uh so I was like, man, let me just, I got to go back to Oklahoma and, and, and uh, you know, I got responsibilities and shit. Let me just do that. And, and he's like, all right, whatever, you know. And so I went back to Oklahoma and started teaching myself again, which I had already, you know, I was pretty good at that you point. Some, you did a lot of tattoos on uh, Faith and everything, right? Like you did some of her. I, would, I didn't tattoo Faith until I'd been doing it for a while. Oh, yeah. And she, is, the only reason I even started tattooing her is because she was kind of getting pissy with me. And the she only reason I didn't, want, I didn't want to fucking fuck her up, you know? Yeah. I'd rather fuck up my friends than fuck up my girlfriend. You know? Yeah, you gotta look at her. Yeah, and so <laughs> uh, it's and, not a joke between you and your girlfriend, like yeah. like it would be with you and your boy, like your boys yeah. or whatever. You hey, yeah. it. fucking did a tattoo on my toe. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mountains, you right. know? <laughs> so, uh, but no, I was tattooing my roommate actually uh, because he didn't care, and he he was like, "Dude, I want, I want your first tattoos." He said it like that. I don't care if they're shitty because I'm gonna say you I have your first tattoos. And I was like, "All right, whatever." That is something I've heard. Someone told me that when, I, and I think they regret it now. Yeah, whatever. So anyway, so I was. <laughs> I guess he has one of yeah, my was, first tattoos. I was about to say I got some of your early shit. Yeah. So I started tattooing him, and I would call Mondo, and 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 um, and Mondo's the guy from California. I don't know if I said his name, but anyway, and so Mondo ended up coming to Oklahoma. And tattooing some people out there, and I learned some more off of him. And you know, and I would go back to California and I would do some more learning and hanging out with Mondo, knows so many people in California. Yeah. Like, I was hanging out with some artists that people like dream of. Everybody white out. has a Mexican friend named Mondo. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say, we got like two of them. <laughs> yeah, I was they like, know I know everybody. two yeah. fucking Mondos. Well, well, Mondo, first of all, I can't say enough about Mondo because he is the most genuine, nicest coolest and everybody says this but the dude is legit yeah and he because he's such a cool guy he knows the best people you Mm -hmm. know and so i was meeting artists that most people go their whole careers dreaming of meeting and i was hanging out with him playing pool you know why you know why i think that is though and this is this is just a thought but i think that the more confident self-confident and the more talented you are as a person as an artist the more approachable and the more humble and the more everything you are. Because I, f- I feel like I was an arrogant prick when I wasn't good at airbrushing or custom <laughs> painting. And the better I got, the less of an ego and the less of a per- of an asshole I was. Because I feel like I, you know, kind of like you were saying earlier, it's like you have this like persona that you feel like you need to have with your skill level. And it's not until you get to a certain level of skill that you realize that that is all bullshit. Well, yeah. I think I was lucky. Now, I'm not going to lie and say I, I, I never had that because I'm definitely guilty of it. And I'm sure some people would back that up. But um, uh, I have people in my life to put me in my place. Yeah. In fact, every time I hear that Beastie Boys song. Which one? He got, I got people in my life that I respect when I think I'm too good. They put me in check. There you go. I, every time it's I hear that. Easy. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fucking <laughs> See, I I actually have confidence issues with my own shit, and I think that's a big drawback for me. 
is because I can I have a hard time feeling confident in the things I'm doing. You know what I mean? Well, you also you need you need a mom and you need a dad. You need somebody to tell you you're amazing, and you need to tell somebody you need somebody to tell you. To all I have me. is just people telling. I'll me I'll tell I'm you your shit, shit all yeah. day long. Yeah. <laughs> all I have is people telling me I'm shit all day long. I don't have no, but that, that's one thing that that you know. Even with this podcast, you know what I mean. Like, like I wanted people to 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 a get an insight into like you know in in reality in some in some alternate universe me and you are in competition for each other cuz we both airbrush even though we're not in a hundred in no way form I think the competition probably at a certain point it went from us to the people around us yeah right yeah yeah and i and you know when you when you talk about that group that that Corey St. Clair and that Steve Gibson and and yourself and you know uh Charles Armstrong and these amazing airbrush artists it's like they all want to see each other doing well they're not like no, we get excited. You, it's yeah. like you're lighting a fire under me, man. Like every time they have a success, I feel like it's our success. Like, yeah, it's just that it, it's it's that the internet has shown us that we have this old uh, like like mentality that you know everything is business and everything is competition, right? Because a lot of you know you we're essentially close to the same age. You know, in the 90s, we didn't have, you know, and your dad grew up in the same business like mine did. So they had to hustle in a different manner than we did. And we had to go through the 2000s where the Internet was trying to understand what it's going to be. And now we're in the 2010s or whatever you want to call this, the teens. And we found a way to use the Internet to our advantage. Right. Right. And we are not threatened by each other as we would have been if this was 1996. Yeah, you're right because there was a time when everybody was swimming in a much smaller pond. Smaller pond. Yeah. Now, you know, we look at, you know, I look at the United States as like, you know, 20, 40, 30, 50, 100,000 people potential customers for us and I'm like, well, I can't paint 100,000 fucking bikes. And I know me and you can't paint 100,000 bikes. <laughs> And I know me and everybody that I know that paints can't paint 100,000 bikes. So why am I concerned about what you got? There's there's enough to go around, man. And you know what? If, if tattoos didn't show you that, then I don't know what the fuck Dude, dude there's so much work out there. You shouldn't be in competition for work. And if you are in competition for work, you need to think about your quality. Yeah. Because... I saw somebody on the internet the other day. I haven't posted shit on Facebook in years, but I've I saw I saw a post when I was on there the other day, and, and no offense to the guy that wrote it, I'm sure you're a great guy, but uh, he said, "Hey, is anyone else out there sick of losing work to vehicle wraps?" And I was like, <laughs> "No, nope." <laughs> if you're worried about losing work to vehicle wraps, you need to start thinking about your Maybe work. Maybe you should start doing vehicle wraps. <laughs> or yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> can't beat them, join them. Yeah, if you if you can't win a job because they went to a vehicle wrap, then your shit must bunk. And, and maybe his is. I didn't look at his work, so I'm sorry for the guy that wrote it. But no, I don't lose work to vehicle wraps. You know, uh, let me let me ask you this, and you give you give me your honest opinion. So. As a painter, as an airbrush artist, as a custom painter, you've seen all the gimmicks that come into our industry. I don't the, fuck with them. Exactly. No. All right. So let me finish the deal and you tell me. <laughs> all, right. all right. So the gimmicks, the, the light up paint, the, the fucking glow in the dark shit, the fucking uh, the button that changes the color of your car that's on YouTube and all this type of shit. You know, and you get customers that hit you up and go, hey, man, I want to do this. I'm like, man, I, you know, I don't I don't want to be a gimmick painter. I don't want to do things that, like, I want you to seek out my work for my work. Right. And I want that to be the gimmick, if there's going to be a gimmick. Not that, hey, man, look, throw a bucket of hot water on my car right quick and watch it change colors. Yeah, that's bullshit. If you're impressed by that, then I'm not impressed by you. Honestly. Woo! There you go. Yeah, so. I'm using that. (laughs) Trademark uh, 2018 Ricky Bobby. Uh, (laughs) Or Ryan Townsend, sorry. Well, it just tells me something about your taste, man. Why the fuck did you say Ricky Bobby? <laughs> you don't remember the movie? Yeah, Tom I remember goes, that. You're not first or last? Yeah, there you go. Whatever. Not first uh, or last. But no, that's the truth. That's my opinion on it. I don't use gimmicks. Um, if you got to use a gimmick, then you're, you're, no. you, you have nothing to offer. I'll, I'll use like sparkle paint and candy and cool shit like that uh, because it accents what, what I'm you're working doing, yeah. on. But I don't use it to, get, to grab attention. I want my attention to be my my de- my artwork. Yeah. And like if anything, I get pissed when people think I used a gimmick. Like that fucking bike, the Noir bike, I used to 
when I would show it off at different shows and stuff, um, people would walk by it and they'd try to pick out my gimmick. They or they pick out my trick. Yeah. So they would always go like, like I would just stay in the distance in the crowd and just observe. Mm. And um, I would see people pass the bike and they'd look at it and they go, um, somebody go, oh wow, look at that. And then some know it all next to him will go like, oh yeah. You see what they did is they probably used a transfer. Uh, if you just do this and you do that and then you do this and you glue it down and then you can clear over it and all this other shit. And I'm sitting there going. And then I'd wait for the right moment, and a part of me wants to fucking jump his ass, like, listen here, fucking know it all. But uh, he's the guy that watches Roseanne and TV shows all day long. (laughs) Yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, he never tried to learn the trade. He just thinks that he. In fact, I'm not even into doing the, you know, and I don't. I'm sorry for people that I offend, but I don't like the idea of painting it on a paper and then laminating that on the motorcycle. I'm gonna paint it on the fucking motorcycle. (laughs) Okay. Jace does that. What? I'm just kidding. Is that you? You do that? No, no. I was talking. I know there's people that do it. And wait, wait, say that again. No, no, no. I don't do it. The paint, you paint on the transfer and then you, you transfer sell the that. transfer to the deal. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. that's probably efficient. That, if you're in it for money. No, I don't do that. No, Jason. Somebody, that. somebody. We, we know that's close know to us. That, does it. does great work. And that's more power to him. I personally am yeah. not into it. Yeah. I, I'm, I, if that pisses you off, I apologize. I hope you can be friends with me. But I. I'm not into it. Yeah. If it's not done the hard way, then it's not done my way. The fucking hard way, man. That's the only way. That's the only way I fucking want to yeah. do it. I want to do it in a way that's the fucking hardest way because I don't want somebody picking out my shit and going, man, I'll bet they did this and I'll bet they did that. And I'm like, no, actually, you know not only did I do that, I did it with only an airbrush. You know, um, And I did it with your fucking uh, bullshit Mako paint. You know, the- like I want to do it the fucking hard way. And your mom watched me. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a new dynamic that I'm starting to come into with uh, our brand, the Fast Life and stuff like that. Um, and this is something, you know, like I said, we all get in these deep thoughts and figuring out life and shit. And, uh, you know, as an artist uh, or some form of it, if, if I could call myself that and, you know, the, the artist that you are, it's like there's something awesome about feeling like you're leaving a legacy be- behind with the work that you do, right? Mm-hmm. And then you got to think like all the artwork that I've done in my lifetime is on tins. It's on motorcycle parts. Yeah, that'll wear on you. Yeah. It's wearing on me right now. And so the the with my gold bike, I don't know if you, you're probably not familiar with it, but I I built a gold bike, I painted it. It was it was I rode it all over the country coast to coast. And um right when I was at the point where I was ready to repaint it and go with something new, I decided to sell those parts to somebody else. And uh I didn't really know how it was going to take. I, you know, I threw it on the internet, you know, on Instagram and, uh, just bam, 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 like fucking hyenas jumping on it. Like I want it, I want it, I want it. And then, uh, you know, I was thinking like, man, okay, well, Hey, I'll take the, I had some numbers on the side. They were my, they were my daughter's soccer number. It was number 19 on the side, the side cover of the bike. And I was like telling the guy that bought the parcel, Hey man, uh, if you don't mind, man, uh, I'll, I'll repaint the side covers. That way, you know, there's nothing personal to me on there. And he goes, no, dude, I want it just like that. Right. Because it's a collect. It's a cl- you're collecting. Yeah. You, you, he gets to own a piece of you. Yeah. And that's what people enjoy, man. That's art. That's real art. Yeah. And a that's real what I art. felt like, you know. You're not no, a manufacturing. Guess what? guess what? You can't manufacture hey, hey, Inspirato. I know what? what he's about to say. What? Go ahead. Those parts went to Hawaii. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, and it was uh. just... It was the you know what I mean, and guys like you and Corey and and even Thornton, you know all right. the people we know. Don't say even Thornton. Thornton's a badass. Yeah, Thornton is a yeah. dude. I'm, I I got to get him on here too, but just all the people that that are in this industry that's inspired me in my career, you know, I, I can't imagine the different struggles that you deal with, and it's fun to talk to you because I'm like, oh shit, I deal with the same shit that you deal with, yeah. and it's just like a lot of people that listen to this. They're dealing with the same shit or trying to understand or trying to wrap their mind around the same things that we're, we've already gone through, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you start doing art, when you, when you step back and you say, hey, this is a painting, but it's on a gas tank. And the gas tank has value, whether or not my paint job is on it or not, it kind of does deter you like, oh, fuck, man. Like, you know? Well, I personally... Well, I gotta go to the bathroom again. But anyway, my, I I pers- <laughs> do. No, no we, you, we we're can, going all night, yeah, dude. We can we got we can take a take a break. I'm gonna take a quick break, and then I'll I'll talk about what are we talking about? 
We need to talk. We got we got so much shit we got to cover tonight. We will we be, got a lot of industry shit we need to okay, talk about. Okay, we'll get into industry shit. We'll, right. we'll start. We'll stop with the personal stuff. Right? Okay, there we go. Right. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> All right. Hello and welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast, Part Three. Mm. All right. So, uh, me and you, we were in SEMA. And uh, we got to spend some time together and, and shoot the shit. And, uh, you know, a lot of people listen to this podcast have heard me kind of give my thoughts on SEMA. And they've, you know, any paint, any painter I've talked to. Going to this honestly, conversation, I'm not going to say anything that's going to piss people off too much. You might. Okay. All hey, right. I apologize to anyone listening. It's not, it's not people, it's. Things. It's the, uh, it's the corporate, corporate side of. The custom paint Okay, industry. we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. You I know. just want to say a disclaimer. I'm sorry if anyone's offended by what I say. <laughs> um, so I talk about this a lot. And, you know, while I was sitting, and, I, and I'll just, you know, give the cliff notes of it. While I was sitting at SEMA, what I saw was amazingly talented artists giving everything away for free for the simple fact of being in a place. While companies spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not less or more, to be in that place, okay. all for the all for the sake of networking, right? It you know, and I feel, and my argument is that is that too many too many paint related businesses capitalize off custom paint to sell their products, which means right. they capitalize off guys like yourself, myself, Corey, all these other people. Which I know that there are levels of people getting things from these com- these companies, but. The one thing that bothered me the most is is airbrush artists and custom painters that I've known or been fans of for my whole life, and you know they've not been compensated or taken well, taken care of through these companies that they promoted their entire lives. Yes, that's true. Yeah, and I feel like, uh, well, our industry is a sketchy one because um, the artists. We are not the industry. We are just, um, how do you say it? We're, we're the hot chick on the poster. We're not the fucking product. Yeah. We're not the beer. We're the we're the girl with the bikini on. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the what you're really selling is beer. So if you're talking about the industry, uh, if we're at a booth giving away attention for free, you know, like we're, we're a gimmick. We're, we're a, going back to gimmicks. We are, we're, we catch the attention because they really make their money in production work, Mm -hmm. uh, industry, like the actual industry that makes the world go round, not pictures on vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, but we are attention grabbers. So, I think for the artists, everyone's motivated by their own reasons. I personally do it because I enjoy, for the same reason I talked about before, about I wanted to be a part of that fraternity. I don't think so much now it's like, I don't want to be a part of the fraternity. I just really like hanging out with them. And I like, like for instance, I don't expect anything out of Iwata when I paint in Iwata booth. Like if they give me free shit, cool, but I really don't care. anymore because there's nothing that I want anymore I'm not a hungry young guy like I was like where I just wanted attention please give me free things please help me out because I'm starving and I'm trying to be successful but now I do it personally um because I like it now if you're saying there's and 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 I'll agree there is a, a distortion where um I think some of the artists who have done the most salesman work by being a really good bikini model are not not being properly compensated or respected. And I think some of these industries might think they're doing a lot for them, but they don't realize how much they actually do for them. I think that uh, with this day and age of social media and... um, like take for here's the deal i i'll be completely honest and i have no problem being i don't ever plan on going back to sema 
to be honest with you. I do. I, I like doing it. I like I know, being around I, my friends. I love being around the uh, the airbrush guys and stuff like right. that, but I don't like the corporate you side. You don't like the corporate side. All and right. I, I'll agree with you there. So, Although there's some people on the corporate side that I really like. There are some good people, but, you know, um, sitting in the House of Color booth this, this last year uh, and, and watching, I just, I don't, man... My social media is not the biggest in the world. Like, I'm not a chick with my tits out, so I'm not like 100,000 followers. I'm not, or a million followers. It's retarded nowadays, right? And I'm not on TV, so I'm not like an average painter that's on TV that's got fucking 500,000 followers. I'm a great painter that's not on TV that's got 20,000 followers. Um, But my thing is, is that you spend all year painting bikes and doing the things that we do every day with especially with you and what you do now with, with your tattoo work with the airbrush work i can't imagine the the the, the people that want to do what you do and the questions you get asked and the and the questions you answer between oh, yeah. the tattoo machine the ink the airbrush the paint the the tape the, the I everything wish there you was use. a number that went along with how many airbrushes paint and everything that i've sold and if i'm being completely honest now, I love the people at Awada, and they've helped me out quite a few times. But if I'm being completely honest, if it's a numbers-to-numbers numbers thing... They owe you a lot of money. No, no, we're even in the ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. But I, they didn't hire me as the thing. I volunteered that information. True. Now, this is where, this is where I feel like the, the industry is going to take some changes, or, or it's going to be... And by the way, Awada, if you're listening, it's not just you, it's... Yeah. everything else yeah and, and don't get me wrong i'm not i'm not trying to single out companies and say you guys are the corporate fucking evil people no world. and i want what i'm people. trying to show is it is it companies need to understand that in this new medium that we have with social media we're valuable we're a lot more valuable than, we than you're giving best. us there was a time when well for instance think about this now the magazines are going out okay and if they're not already completely out um and the mag, the, these companies would pay large amounts of money to just have an ad in a magazine, right? Mm-hmm. Now the most powerful form of advertising is social media. And the most powerful people in social media are the artists themselves now. Yeah. And the artists themselves are not, I don't think, and I'm not, I can't say this with all they certainty. still have some old mentality they need to let go of. The tables I, have turned, bitch. Well, yeah, and I think they need to. I need. I think they need to not only take care of us, but like, they, there's more that could be done. Is what I'm saying. Like, there's a lot of guys out there that do a lot of work and a lot of legwork for these people. And these people, I don't feel like properly. It's funny. I've been using Iwata this whole time. I, actually, I'm talking about other companies more so. It's just Iwata is where I like to go. But uh, th- these companies, um. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, honestly. You know what I, I think I, the answer there, is? There, there is there, there, maybe if there's a discount code or something that that where the the artists that do all the legwork. Now, I'm not one of those artists anymore because I'm not on social media too much. Uh, and truthfully, I didn't see the value in it. Um, I, yeah, because there's no value in selling shit for everybody else and you get nothing for it other than like a pat on the back. You get a pat on the back and a free airbrush now and again. Yeah, not but, worth it. But... I and and I do I do I love the one or two actually you know I've had a few airbrushes um, I bought my last five airbrushes with yeah. my own money I need I need airbrushes right now so yeah I'm and if yeah you're listening. <laughs> but I'm really I'm really and, an but uh, there's there's other companies like for instance I, you know the company that I think and I'll say this with absolute pride the company that takes care and listens and really really cares is Createx yeah. By leaps and bounds. And those guys somehow have found out, not that it, I, I've heard that it's kicked them in the ass a few times. Mm-hmm. And where it kicks in, hey, by the way, those of you listening, if you're the guy that takes free shit and then tries to resell it, fuck you. Yeah. You're, the, you're the problem. You're the reason that we can't get any love. Because being sponsored or, or getting kickbacks is not something that should be taken lightly Mm -hmm. and if you're abusing that um you don't you don't deserve it yeah you're yeah definitely you're you're setting us 10 steps back instead of 10 steps forward yeah yeah but you know the uh the main thing that i think and and it's it's not a complicated thought process you know i you know like i said i walked around sema for fucking a week 
you know, and I watched some of the best guys in the industry run with their head, like run from booth things, to booth. Yeah, you. Th- that's probably true. Like what I'm saying, a lot of these companies do give a lot of kickbacks. Um, I just don't, I don't know necessarily that it's an equal proportion. Absolutely not. Like, but then again, we have no way of really tracking it. Like, if you were to say bring this up to a company, like, if you said to a company that, um, uh, hey, I've sold you this many things or I've sold this much product, okay, you have no way of tracking it, nor do they. So it's not even their fault for not recognizing it. You have to almost bring it to them and say, look what I can do for you. And then it becomes a business. Now you're in the business of selling products and not in the business of being an artist. It, it, there, there's a double-edged sword there. Sword there. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very finite thing. But, you know, without being too complicated, like, is, I would think the goal is to find out how that you can supplement enough, of your, enough income to where you can put out the best work that you're paid. Here's the deal. If you don't have to think... I said, here's the deal again. If you don't have to think about, you know, fuck, my airbrushes are all worn out. I need a new one. You know, now I got to do this job and I got to take out $450 to buy a new Micron. Well, I mean, that's the business. I mean, maybe, I don't know. It's funny. It's a, I'm trying to say things. It's a double I'm, I'm trying sword. to, I'm trying to say this that is not only like politically correct. I don't want to get in trouble for anything that I say. And I also want to be realistic, you know, like from our side of it. Uh, the artist side 10 years ago before social media we didn't get shit period anyway okay Mm -hmm. so because we didn't have a platform and we didn't do as much selling and so you know if you did that shit out of the kindness of your heart think about the think about the magazine platform which i'm a huge magazine fan and i'm almost willing to give them a pass that i don't give to social media right a magazine uh used to like try to act like they're doing you a favor by putting you in the magazine and so many people were so happy like fuck i got a magazine article but when you really understand what a magazine is a magazine is made of content and the content that is in the magazine sells to the audience that buys the products and they sell the advertising in the magazine so if you said let's just say this that, that let, let's just transfer the concept of like airbrush artists and turn those into pop stars right so you have this tier of airbrush artists. You know, you got your your Ryan Townsend and Steve Gibson and fucking Corey St. Clair, and you guys are all A-list fucking uh, huge rap stars or whatever the fuck is popular right now. So when you get in the magazine, more people want to be sponsored in that magazine, right? right? They want more ad space because they know that that magazine is going to sell There's more. There's value. And I guess if you're the company, I, I have to put myself in the shoes of the people that make these decisions and... I understand a magazine doesn't make the money that they did. No, in the and 90s. I'm not talking about magazines anymore. I'm talking about the people who buy ads and the people who would compensate you for your time. For instance, yeah. if what you've got here's what you got at SEMA, and this I think is your actual beef. There are thirty plus artists, top tier artists, and not all of them are paying their own way, but most of them are paying their own way. Yeah, to get to this event, to be a part of this event. And to mainly what they're doing is they just want to show off and hang out with their friends and be a part of this club. But what they're actually doing is selling products for a company who's getting this type of thing for free. Yeah. And now the company justifies it by, I didn't tell them to do it. Mm -hmm. And the people that are getting the attention justify it by, well, you know, it's better than sitting at home doing jack shit. So see I don't see I'm gonna get in there, trouble there, and they're gonna no, take no, this away I'll, from us completely like don't, don't worry about it I'll, I'll be the I'll be the get, bad guy here so I, I enjoy doing it I love the opportunity to be able to yeah paint and I get it a lot of people of do love the opportunity and that's awesome that that's that's important but you know somebody has to be me somebody has to say look this ain't fair this isn't worth it. So what is fair then? I mean, if they paid everybody they'd have to have more of an exclusive group exactly what I was about to say the the I think that a more exclusive group would be great as fuck. Why? Because it, well, then a, you're going to create animosity amongst no, your. I think that no, it's not going to create animosity. It's going to create another goal for someone to strive for. You know what I mean? If 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 say if we're going to be realistically, there's really only a handful of people that I feel are really really top tier airbrush artists that are pushing their craft 
and doing things like that. I'm not saying there's not an amazing uh, array of airbrush artists, and not saying I'm not even I'm even on the fucking list. What I'm saying is, when you got people who spend as much time thinking about art and theory and putting it to application, like you and you know the same people we've been re- reference, referencing all night, those guys I would consider to be a top tier performer with an airbrush, right? Mm-hmm. So if I go to the Iwata booth, I know that a lot of airbrush guys are not going to agree with me, and that's fine. But it's fine. I'll, I'll be the I'll be the escape go bad guy here. I would rather see four of the top tier dudes in the industry getting all the love and me striving to get to that level to get something realistic from I that. think I would agree with you there. But at the same time, that would be a very difficult thing to advertise if you're the seller. Like, for instance, um, okay, let's assume we've been talking about me and, and Corey and Steve for a while tonight, yeah. right? So let's assume that we were three hired to... Uh, um, tear shit up, right? Yeah. You know, we're, 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 the, we're the main event, right? And we're doing something at, at SEMA. Well, now there's no more opportunity for the other guys unless you want to jump on the wall and, and you know, or, or jump on a panel or whatever it might be and, and, and do some other things. But, you know, the, the, the three of us would be the ones that would be featured. Now... Is that something you take turns with? Is that something, you know, because no, there's... You, you is, have to hustle, but then again, you know, I don't know. It's a tougher road. It's not like it's not like selling shoes where Michael Jordan is making all the fucking money and and they can put all their eggs into that basket. We're just a bunch of dudes that paint, you know. True. So, um, and I just want to see those dudes that paint to be yeah. Taken and you're care right. And you're right. There there should be some compensation, but at the same time, you can't. It's like if you're giving away the shit for free. Let's say, for instance, if I didn't show up and paint for free, mm-hmm. somebody else would. Exactly, and that's the problem, is that people are willing to give all their shit away for free for the, the old notion of exposure. I don't, here's a, uh, what, what, but these people what do you the really same, think you're, okay. You're not, I don't think personally, as an artist, uh, you go to I don't SEMA? think you're getting any exposure. I, if you're listening yeah. and you're like, I'm going to go to SEMA and I'm going to get the coolest job ever uh, from my... Can you look this up on the computer? I can't. You can actually go to the... Safari. I can look it up on my Safari. I'm Find out what the cheapest vendor space at SEMA is. Oh, it's it's ten thousand dollars probably. All right, cheapest. So, you know, when you think, and, can and I just the, Google the cheapest vendor space? Yeah, I'm sure it's like ten grand. Come on, Jamie. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, I bet it's more than that. Honestly, probably quite a bit more. So, uh, you know, and and. You, the thing is that I look at my fingernails, I look at the calluses on my hands, I look at the, the you, you told me about your father and, and the, and not, how much hard he worked, uh, how, how hard he worked in the paint industry. Works, works. Yeah, still works. And then you think about like, for us, it's like, realistically, the paint game is almost like the drug game. It's about getting in, making a lot of money and getting the fuck out before you lose your health, right? You're breathing in all this crazy shit. And I know that you, you know, Createx has kind of brought an alternative with, with, uh, a water-based paint and things like that but realistically you know a lot of the industry has to rely on the 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 fact that they have to clear coat base coat primer wet sand body work all this shit just to make it it's like there's only a few people in the industry that have the luxury of doing the artwork and walking away right yeah. and there's some uh, you know there's some talented dudes out there man and i just i want to see you want to see them getting properly compensated yeah. and, and you know what what I like, here's what I want to see. Now, this is on optimistic level. You know what? If, if I was to ask for anything from the companies that, whose products we use, I would ask that more opportunities are created. Like, <clears throat> instead of going to SEMA and, you know, showing off on a few things, like, being hired to, like, for instance, like you said, like, like maybe the three of us go and we do this car for SEMA and we're paid to go to the same shop. We're all flown out before SEMA even opened, yeah. you know, during the, to, to do this thing. And I know it's probably not in their budget, but in all honesty, like that's a dream team thing to me. I, I kind of lost my train of thought and no, talking like about every, that. Everything but. you're saying, though, like, think about it. Like SEMA is a big magazine, right? Think about it. SEMA is a giant magazine. So you know, you have to understand that your content in a magazine and you need to be, you know, 
I, maybe you you just got to start looking at yourself. It's it's like that like we were just talking about. It's a it's a matter of a confidence in yourself. Like you're doing for SEMA just as much as SEMA is doing for you. Right. And if you come in with that attitude like, "Hey, I'm bringing content to SEMA so that people can want to come see it." And it's not just you, you know the what? painters. I think that's a, universal. I think I think talent gets skimped out on the most because they they know our desperation. Like, I've painted for certain p- people, mm-hmm. certain giant companies, yeah. credit card companies, several. Uh, yeah. I've painted, I've been hired by credit card companies. I've been hired by um, uh, insurance companies to go and paint and demo. And what they're really doing is they're selling their product, but they're yeah. using us to be the bikini models. Mm-hmm. And although I'm extremely thankful for that opportunity, um, it's, it's like, they're trying to pay us as little as fucking possible to do this because they know we're desperate. And I think that's true of like people who do reality shows, yeah, like, like you're going to go and you're going to spend all your time being on this reality show for, for not a lot of money because you're just glad to be on TV. They know that. That's why they don't and pay they you capitalize shit. Capitalize off your dumb. They're ass gonna pay the top guy. Yeah, yeah. They're gonna pay that one dude on the top, but they're not gonna pay everyone else. You know, if you're on a if you're on a um, uh, a TV show, everyone equally gets compensated. You know, the top guy gets the most money, but everyone else gets enough money. Right. But on these reality shows and things like that, they pay the top guy, but they don't do fuck for everyone else. They just like, yeah. hey, we gave you exposure, be happy. Like, so I just I just pulled up uh, how much it was for, or I tried to find out exactly how much it was for a booth, but uh, so far it's saying that it's thirty five dollars a square foot for non members, which the minimum size is ten by ten, and you have to add four grand to that rate for island booths, and that's just for like small little setups for vendors. So I can't get like a solid price because it consider it like a premium spot. Yeah, because that that spot, I mean, just that spot might right include there. like because you're like you're, you're like way off the main drag and no foot traffic at all. Yeah, yeah. So thirty five dollars a square foot in the booth minimum is ten by ten, and if you're an island booth, it's a you have to add four grand to. But in the end, charges. in the end, you know what? At yeah. SEMA specifically, it's not buyers that go to SEMA. It's, it's people. It's industry people. Yeah, it's yeah. all industry people. Yeah, so you're not going there. You're not gonna. You're not gonna pick up the client that rides a motorcycle. You're yeah. gonna. Pick you're gonna up, pick up the shop. Which okay. You're gonna pick. No, you're, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pick up the. Um, <laughs> Jace is like the buff. The guy who makes the buffers. Yeah. He's gonna yeah, ask yeah. you, hey, will you buff? Will you paint a, a car for us to put in SEMA next year? Yeah. Will you buff it with this buffer? Yeah, and then shit. and then we can put it in SEMA, and then we'll put your name on it. Yeah, and then your name will but mean you gotta something. But you got to do it for free. But you got to do yeah. it for free because we're gonna let you be in our booth. Yeah, and that that's my that's my. That's beef, the equivalent man. of being like a a chick in Hollywood. Just well, they know you're hungry and desperate. Cause... Now, again, a lot of these companies are really really good people, and their intentions are good. Yeah, but they you know times good. are changing, man. And honestly, it's it, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm promoting here. It's it's I'm promoting times are changing because uh, I feel like there's. Now you're selling, like you said, you're selling more. And, and yeah, there's no way to do it. But here's here's what companies can do. All right, I paint bikes for a living. All right, I don't expect House of Color or Matrix or any company I work with to give me everything I use for free. I no, don't. No, that's unrealistic, right? But uh, proper compensation for the. T- okay, all right. You want me to fucking say it right out? <laughs> I'll say it. The videos that I've made. And I don't do social media like I used to, but yeah. when I was hard on it, you know, the, the videos that I made and everything, I sold more product probably that I, I in fact, I don't know the numbers, but I know the emails you know that I would happened. get. Yeah. I would get emails on a daily basis, so much so that I was overwhelmed because people were asking me what products to buy Yeah. over and over. And that was just the people who had the confidence to, to even email me. There's some people that were just taking what I said on the video or yeah. on the the post, and Jeez. so if you actually now get dangerous. Now, granted, I did it <laughs> voluntarily. I did, yeah. wasn't looking for compensation. Yeah. But if you consider how much a salesman is paid to yeah. sell a product, yeah, as a, and not even sell near as much as I'm selling 
by my my um think about the job think about the jobber that walks into a paint store trying to trying to convince you to buy their new uh magic fucking buff sauce right you know what i mean yeah. and you're like and then you jump on social media and you just do a video of and, and of you the, sold 30 of them but there's no way to track it yeah exactly and it's now you can do promotion code but then you're a fucking hawk artist you know no one's gonna respect you if you're on social media and you're saying hey buy this buffer use my promo code yada yada what a flutter you know whatever you know they're gonna go oh well now he's just selling it because well He's think about this way. Think about this way. All right. So if you're a paint shop, you're a custom paint shop, and you're doing work for average customers that are walking in your shop, but you're using X amount of clear or X company's clear, X company's products, and you're still with the level of integrity that you have as a as a paint shop, you're still putting these products out, right? That means that you're staying behind the products that you're using because you're not gonna put out shitty stuff. Just because you're getting paid no. or getting an incentive. Well, that's the thing. How do you tell your audience, um, I'm genuine? Like, for instance, personally, I'm <laughs> genuine. Anyone listening, if I say I like something, I fucking like it. Yeah. It don't matter. Same thing if, with me, too. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm never going to sell out or push a product. In fact, I've had the opportunity to push products where I've been approached by certain people and they're like, hey, join our team. And I'm like, no. I, I, like, I like what I like. Uh, yeah. You know? And, and they're like... Whatever. And I'm like, no, it's an inferior product. I don't want to be associated. And I'm sorry that I feel that way. You probably do a lot of great work for your product. I'm just not using it. And I'm yeah. not going to tell people I do when I don't. In fact, going back to Createx is why I love them so much. When I first started experimenting with Createx, I told them flat out, you can send me free shit if you want, but I... I'll talk about it, but I'm not going to push it like it's my favorite thing until it is. And it's not right now. I, I like Standox the most. Yeah. And Standox never, doesn't even know who the fuck I am. Yeah. Right? So, but that's what I used. But, so the first version of Createx that I used, <clears throat> not, not a lot. I wasn't that impressed for what yeah. my use was. Yeah. And then I would call them and I'd be like, hey guys, I, thank you for paying attention to me. Thank you for being awesome. I, 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 it still ain't working for me though. It's, yeah. it's not doing this and it's not doing that. And I don't want to change what I do to fit your paint. I would rather your paint yeah. fit what I do. I know that sounds arrogant or whatever. No, it's but perfect. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I was like, and I expressed it to them. You know what? They listened. They, not only did they listen, they were interested. And so the next year they come out with a new product, the, the Createx Illustration Colors. And all of a sudden it's, the flow has gotten so much better. And they explained to me why. And I was like, awesome. And then I started talking to the guys a little more. And um, this is just basic R&D. But the fact is, is they respected me enough to listen to listen, me. Listen, yeah. And so um, I said, all right, you're doing good, but you're not there. And I can't tell people you're great until I know that you are. And right now it's just not happening for my use, for my purpose. And, um, and, and they respected that about me. And so then they would like, Hey, we got this product. We got that product. Try that out. And I try it out and it'd be closer, but not there yet. And then, um, one day they made an unrelated product. And this is, I think why I respect them the most. First of all, we had a good relationship all the way through it. And then one day they came out with, and I think Craig Frazier had a big hand in this, a candy, mm -hmm. water-based candy. And, and I asked him, I was like, what was the holdup? How come you never had water-based candy before? Like, why? What's the, what's the deal? And he started explaining it to me. He was like, oh, well, we've, we got this um, uh, Intercoat Clear, this carrier. Um, and this is probably too technical for a lot of people, so I'll try to breeze through it. He basically said there's this new additive that helps suspend the candy better. And I was like, oh, man, you know what? I think that actually would work for my problem that I've been having yeah, like with your paint. Putting into the and, he, paint. and I was like, do you mind if I try? And he was like, sure. And um, so I went and I tried it. I was like, dude, it worked. My paint actually works. It's, it, this, is, this is my beef the whole time. Mm -hmm. Beef cured. 
this, this additive that you used for the candy colors works for my illustration stuff. And next thing I know, and I left it at that, never said a word to him. Next thing I know, they telling me it was a product we created. It's good. You know, my, my point is they listen, they care, mm -hmm. they send you free product. Do you need anything? Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can send you to help you through your process? And they don't, now he will tell me that there's people that abuse that yeah, and those true. people need to fuck off. But if you're not, you, you need to understand if you're, if you're being sponsored by somebody, you owe it to that sponsor to be the R and D that they need. You're not, this isn't bragging rights. Okay. This isn't for you to, it's not a status thing. Yeah. It's an honor to be sponsored, and once you have a sponsorship, you need to do your part and explain to them what could improve about their product. And, mm -hmm. and if they listen to you and actually improve their product, that's a fucking awesome company. Yeah. You know, like, you know that the work that you're doing is not in vain. And so... Well, when you have certain companies that are like stables in the industry, like... Uh, Some of them get confident. They're like, hey, we're selling shit anyway. So yeah, they, they have this cocky confidence that you have to deal with. And, and the problem is, is that, um, you know, they're, they're one... Here's, this is the thing about like nowadays, right? People with the internet, with, with the connectivity that they have, we can all find out where everything is made. And nobody's making shit on their own really you know and the last thing that, that that you know one thing i love about like a paint huffer is a is a metal flake company they make a lot of products and we use them and they're just like you talked about with createx they realize the problem that that people are having with these companies that these bigger name companies like these hoks and ppgs where they're they're constantly raising prices to meet the uh auto body standards that doesn't quite apply to the custom paint you know what I mean? Custom paints a two or three percent market, and auto body is the ninety eight percent market. But custom paint makes up for ninety nine percent of the promotional advertising of every company. I'll leave it at this because I feel like we're dragging this topic out. the The industry should pay better attention. I do think, and I think some of them do better jobs than others. And if they're listening and they can take anything from me, hey, you know what? More so than that, stop giving away your shit for free, kids. Yeah. Uh, if you're trying to get noticed, do better artwork. Win a contest. Uh, win, what is that? My, one of my favorite phrases. If you're tired of being denied, be undeniable. You don't go kiss an ass at a fucking show. And, yeah. and, um, because you're you you are the, the the beef that we just bitched about for the last however many minutes. It was because why give away you know if you're giving away shit for free, you know because you want the attention. Now if you're doing it for the camaraderie like I do it, and I used to do it for attention too. But the point is, be undeniable and don't think that SEMA or anything like it is what's going to give you. They're, those people are there to use you to sell products. They're not there. Because I give a fuck about your reputation. Yeah. And if you think that going there is going to up your... Now, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a lot of shit to gain from going to those things. Yeah, true. Because there is. Absolutely. It's networking. That's why the whole thing exists. It's an, it's an industry thing. But that is not going to sell you work at home. Mm -hmm. You are not going to make more money because you went to SEMA. Yeah, now, Christmas. you could probably hang a plaque on your wall to impress your clients coming in the door. But the fact is... If you're not doing good work, you're not going to get fucking paid. You're yeah. not going to get clients. Now, if you're doing cheap work, fuck you too because you're dragging the industry down. Yeah. So, so when you get back from SEMA... Uh, no, I don't get a single piece of work from SEMA. No, November 10th, um, guess what? All the people you just promoted, look at their fucking Facebooks and Instagrams and see if all their kids are getting great Christmas presents a month later. Well, yeah, but they're the fucking... You volunteered that shit. Now, True. you're right. You're right. We should get better comp compensation or whatever. But the thing is... Start selling your paint work and your abilities as a real yeah, business. Yeah, you're a painter, okay? You're not a fucking... It's like, it's like a musician. If you're Beyonce and you get a kickback because he sells handbags, you're not a handbag salesman. You're, you're a fucking musician. You're Beyonce. You, you know, you're not a salesman. You're, you're not going to SEMA. It's not going to make you more money. Yeah. All it does is it, it's a fun place to hang out. It sells 
it, it sells yourself. It gives you validation. Um, but in the end, don't don't think that these companies are 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 they don't they don't care about you that much. Yeah, true. Now on on a brighter note, so you know, I think what you and uh, uh, fuck, I'm drunk enough to forget names right now. Yeah, no. Well, I art called circus. it. I was like, it's dangerous. You're getting dangerous. Yeah, we need to talk about the art circus. We gotta start art circus, and then we're done. Okay, all right. All right. Art right we're at now. okay. Are, are you going? All right. We're at two and a half hours right now. So we got one so more we, thing to talk we about. We got one doing. more thing to talk about. Yeah. So we're back. So art circus. Uh, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm drunk. Fuck so it. <laughs> God What's his name damn again? it. Uh, no, no, we're fine. I'll talk uh, about the art circus. Please. All right. Please, so, sir. Going back to the original part, if you guys have been here this whole time, then, then you remember I set a goal that I wanted to teach, right? Yeah. And I was actually teaching online um, through YouTube and everything else. And that is a strong, strong passion of mine. Um, it always has been ever since the, you know, I started on my YouTube channel and since... Uh, I went to that first getaway. Um, and just like we were talking about, you know, industry and, and ups and downs, that sometimes things can get flooded between selling products and uh, actually doing what you came there to do, which is teach mm -hmm. and, and get people interested in the things that you're interested in and sharing your own knowledge. Well, at the art circus, we recognized that there was something missing and we wanted to bring... Um, we wanted to teach for the right reasons and not saying that other places don't, they do. It's just, we didn't want it to be, uh, we didn't want the salesman part of it to be distracting to the event itself, yeah. which is we want people to be better at the thing we love to do, which is paint and yeah. airbrush and, and pinstripe. Because we, in the end, we got into this because we have a passion for it and it doesn't matter whether we sell airbrushes or we sell paint or or whether or not we're loyal to these other companies it what really matters is do we love what we do and do we love to share what we do and do we love to see other people get better at it so we started this thing i say we it was rob churchill more than anything um that we called the art circus and it is like the getaway and like like a lot of the other places Except we like to say that it's for us, by us. It's an art. So FUBU. It's FUBU. <laughs> it's FUBU for real. <laughs> but no, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. It, it, because, first of all, Rob doesn't tell us what to teach, or and nor does he tell us what sells and what doesn't sell. Now, if your class isn't you know, selling, he might tell you that. But what I'm saying is we teach what we think is important because we're the ones doing it. Yeah. Right. We're not being influenced by other people who are worried about a tagline or, um, you know, whether or not it sells tickets. We want people to be better at what they do and what they're passionate about. And we, we find a good, like a huge amount of joy out of teaching. And my class, our class, it was, it's me and Steve Gibson. We teach a class called uh, Freedom to Freehand. And this class came from, um, I thought there was something missing. When I went to that first thing, the first getaway, I thought these techniques are all really cool, but not a lot of people are teaching what I consider to be the most important things. Because when I learned how to paint and I got really good at it, I felt like it wasn't something that I learned in a class. It was something that I learned on my own. And... And I felt like those types of things were missing from, from uh, teaching. And, and so I told um, Rob about it and I said, hey, man, I think this is important. And I think this is really what will make people better. It's not the most glamorous idea. Hey, it's freehand. Everyone's intimidated by that. Oh, my God, it's scary, you know, because I don't get to use a stencil and I don't get to have all these easy tricks. It's not arts and crafts. It's real lessons that are going to make you better. And I'm like, I want to make people better. I don't care if they leave there with a fancy panel that they can show off to all their friends. I want them to be smarter. Yeah. I want them to be more skillful when they leave. And, I, and that's not an attractive thing to say to other people that are actually trying to sell tickets because they want, they want you to have um, something you can show off when you're done so it looks, yeah. like, so it looks 
Look, I paid $500 for this panel. Yeah, look, look I what already, I did. I did. Yeah, yeah, look what I did because somebody held You're my hand. You're teaching someone to fish, man. Sure. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying I can sit here and I can put the bait on the hook for you and I can uh, tell you where to fucking cast it. But in the end, is that going to make you a better fisherman? No. I'm going to teach you how to motherfucking fish. And yeah. that's what my class is. That's why my class is called Freedom to Freehand. It's, we designed it in a way that anyone can take it. Anyone can learn. It doesn't matter if you're a veteran or if you're a beginner. There's something to learn because these are the core values or the core um, things. I, I taught you some of this shit yeah. before. It, you, you, you take what you want from it. Now, you can leave there and do exactly what I said, or you can just take what you need from it. But in the end, what I care about most is are you better than when you walked in? Mm-hmm. You know, Not did you learn how to use my trick. Did you actually learn... A, a, something that makes you a better person or a better artist it's more skillful and so that's why we have uh, the art circus and that's in San Antonio um, it's probably too late if you're listening to this if you're you, listening to this you'll hear it on Tuesday of what's next week Tuesday Tuesday of next week yeah what, okay so you've got a few days you to got make a couple it. days to make <laughs> it happen yeah so but it's in San Antonio I think on the 30th of this month um I think it's like the the Cinco de Mayo weekend, so it's you're the, like the yeah, fifth, yeah. yeah, or something like that. I if it, it, third for the if you got the time to squeeze it in, I highly recommend, and we should be able to get you in, even if it's last minute. Yeah. Okay. So if you're listening to this and you're like, oh shit, I got one day, two days, whatever, <clears throat> um, you can make it. Yeah. Um, what month are we in? What is this? April. We're in April. April. So I, I think it's April 30th if I'm not mistaken, and then the last day is the fourth of uh, May, and. Um, so yeah, squeeze it in, and not just my class. Everyone's classes are yeah. Uh, everyone who's who's all going. So you got Darren Wenzel. You yeah, got Darren Corey. Wenzel teaches the pinstriping class. Um, Corey St. Clair teaches uh, portraits. Um, Steve and I we teach freedom freehand, which is really focuses on um, how to paint like like a classic painter. Yeah. And, and those things I think will make you better, and no matter what style you're after, so don't feel intimidated by it. Um, uh, let's see, there's a, um, shoot, I'm drawing blanks here. Um, there's a, a, a class that's all about prep work. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's called prep to polish. So it teaches you how to fix dents. Yeah. Jesse needs that class. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking it right. teaches you how to fix dents. Like do all the, all the, all the, all the basic the work, core but you, you still get to, to do artwork too. There's yeah. a guitar class. Um, is Mike Learn? Mike involved? Learn? Yeah, Mike Learn's teaching. Um, I got my basics down. Yeah, so the guitar class teaches you how to... And you know what I like found out about a, this? I didn't know. These guitars finished are worth like upwards of $1,200 or more. You can buy a kit for 125 if I'm not mistaken. So if you take his class, you're making money, man. Because uh, you can go in there, build a guitar tune it, finish it, you know, so you, you prime it, paint it, finish it, polish it, and uh, tune it, and you can sell it. Now, it. now, as it sits, even if you paint it in one color, it's worth $1,200 mm-hmm. finished. Yeah. So that is quality for anyone that wants to take it. Yeah, you know, uh, me and Mike learn kind of go way back, uh, and I, I hope, you know, with him living up in Boulder, Colorado, I, I plan on getting him on the podcast soon. We have a lot of very, very similar views on the industry and mm-hmm. things like that. And Mike learns not scared to speak his mind either. Yeah, he's a yeah. uh, and, and he and he fucking had the nuts to try mm-hmm. and go off the beaten path, which yeah. I highly respect. Yeah, you know, I don't know re- the reasons why he kind of backed off of his pursuit, but he really did. I wouldn't fucking, say he backed off. He's just got other goal. Oh, he's yeah. got other priorities. Uh, man. It, it 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 blossomed into other things. And I he's working on guitars. He don't, it's like me and and, and you know. My biggest thing, the only reason I tiptoe through conversations, I don't, I don't want to fucking bag on somebody else's. Yeah, fucking, yeah, definitely. I mean, that, you, that's you, kind of you, thing. I, I, Mike, I would assume, and I can't speak for him. I don't know him that well, but he, he's got his own shit going on, man. He, he's not worried about whether he goes to SEMA or not. Yeah, he doesn't give a fuck. He's just doing his thing. How much did the uh, classes usually run? Um, I'm not 100 percent on those. I want to say. 600? Like 550, 600, something, yeah, like that. something like that. Um, but I will say, 
take these classes. Like if you guys are listening, I, agree. I, I, agree. I hope this, if you're an aspiring um, airbrusher or, or custom painter or whatever it might be, and you're like me and you want to really take this thing somewhere. And I hope I didn't like stray you by saying I got into tattoos. Some people think that's a negative no, thing. No, no, man. Like- um, but uh, this class is what we, when you say like, I wish I could teach what somebody, what I want to teach what I wish somebody would have told me. Yeah. That's what this is. You ever feel like back in the day, like the videos they used to put out, they'd always leave out this one key ingredient. <laughs> Not me. That, like the secret no, sauce. No, no, no. Like the old like airbrush mm. action videos. Oh, like, I know they did. You would be like trying to do it and you're like, there's something missing in this fucking, oh, yeah. you know, recipe. I know they did. Well, here's the thing about those. And uh, All right. <laughs> they're not here anymore, so fuck them. You yeah. know what I mean? They're, uh, they're still around. But yeah. they, the thing is, a lot of those videos, they were worried about marketing them. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, what can I teach that somebody can get something from that sells more mm-hmm. videos? Right? It's a marketing thing. So they have to make it approachable. So I wouldn't say necessarily that they're leaving anything out. Because I've seen those videos and most a lot of them are really quality videos, but um, yeah. But in the end, what they're doing is they're they're selling a gimmick. Mm-hmm. Like I recorded a video once and I was told, "Stop talking so much. People don't want to hear that shit. Just paint." And I was like, "I want to hear it if I was watching this. Yeah. Like, who the fuck are you to tell me what they want or don't want?" And they're like, "Well, it sells more vi- videos or whatever because they just want to see you paint or whatever." And um, we don't do that at the art circus. Like, I let the fucking students tell me what to say. Like, I even ask them, like, hey, am I boring you with this? Mm-hmm. You know, with my insider knowledge or with my experience? They say yes or no. And if they, they're like, hey, we want to get to paint, I was like, go fucking paint then. <laughs> you know, but if you want to hear more about my theories, and my exp- then I'll, I'll keep even going. Even if you went to that class and you never touched paint, and you just took in all the information and conversation you can gain from I get I personally get more from conversation yeah. than I do with um, practicing for yeah. instance like I'm more about theory I want to know how your brain works how you made it to that conclusion more so than I want to see you like seeing you do it that gives me a lot but more so than I want to sit there in a corner having you babysit me while I'm scribbling you know yeah. like like, no, 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 you're doing it right. No, 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 you're doing it right. I want to talk to you because I can go scribble at home. Yeah. I want to get as much out of you as I can. And so... Yeah, pick your brain. Kind yeah, of yeah. And so, like, I think me and Steve have a good balance. Uh, I'm more of a talker and I'm more theoretical. That's why I talk so much on this podcast. But <laughs> um, but Steve is... He, he's, he's better at um, kind of uh, honing in that information, you yeah. know? Uh, so we make a good balance. So if I confuse you, Steve will cr- will catch it. We give you another. It's kind of like a two different learning ways, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean? Steve is and like. I, I think that's a good thing about having teams when you're doing certain classes and that stuff. You know what I mean? Because you have uh, a couple people that might click with certain pe- personalities well, uh, or learning abilities in a more effective manner than other ways. You know what I mean? So, like, some people are visual and verbal and, you know, whatever the case may be. So, you got someone that just want to, like, I can watch you airbrush all day and, like, you don't have to say a fucking word. I can just watch you and I can learn. Some people need to be explained what you're doing. Right. As an author. And, and there is different people. Like, I've been told once to just shut up and paint. Yeah. And I'll learn what I learned from you. And I'm like, all right, if that's you, that's you, you know. And... There's other people that really get off on my theoretical stuff when I break things down into like um, relatable stories. Like when I talked about the the lake and the water, you know, it's like that's how my brain understands it. Yeah. I understand. Like you can't just say, how do you do this and expect me to, or am I doing this right? Expect me to go yes or no. Yeah. I don't have that. I have to give you a story. I have to give you a relatable story because that's how I understand it. Like when I reach my conclusions, that give me a lot of success. It's because there's a story that went along with it. I did this, which led to that, which led to this conclusion. And that's how I do it. And I think about that conclusion and that story every time I use that until it becomes intuitive. Mm -hmm. So my version of an explanation is like, I'll tell you how I came to that answer. 
I'll tell you how I get to that answer. Like if you want to know how to make flesh tone, I'm not going to say take some reddish brown and add it to white Mm -hmm. because that's not, to me, that's not teaching you anything. I'm going to say, I'm going to describe the color wheel and I'm going to be like, all right. And I'll give you my visual. You know, I'll say like, you know, well, if you add green to red, you know that that turns it into brown and um, you, if you want a reddish, you know, I'll give them the visual that goes along with it. And that's my version of the answer. Now you take someone else, their version of the answer is just yes or no. They just want to see you do it. And you know, that's different people. Yeah. And we evaluate that at the time. And, and, but that's it, probably a good thing about the art circus is that you're, uh, you know, well, at any rate, man, like, you know, the concept is, is that there are leaders in the custom paint industry from the airbrush pinstriping to graphic layout to the theory of buffing a motherfucking part. You know what I mean? So, you put that all in the same place and, you know, it's good for people. And it's good because you, most of those places, if it's anything like the uh, getaways, you can bounce around like, oh, okay, you know, I'm yeah. kind of good here. I'm going to go check out the fucking buffing theory over here. You know what I mean? I'll leave, I'll leave this at this. We did this for the right reasons. If you think you've already been to one of these types of things before mm-hmm. or you might not get anything from it, we demand you get better. We demand that when you leave the art circus, you're better for it. Mm-hmm. We don't ask you to learn. We don't, we demand that you learn. We want you to learn because we are the students of, of yesteryears, I guess. We, we do this for the right reason. So if I'm selling the art circus, I'm selling it for the right fucking reasons. Yeah. Like I really, really care that you are a better artist. I really, really care that you are somebody that I'm going to be chasing one day. And so if you take it for no other reason, then do it for that. But we do our shit. That's that's the best way to do it. I think uh, uh, now that artists are actually, uh, you know, controlling that, that's a good thing. We are. I think so. You know, know, I think so. Nothing wrong with Airbrush, actually. Nothing wrong with the people in the past. But it's exciting seeing actual artists hone and create and and create uh the curriculum for other aspiring artists yeah and it's not the same regurgitated shit and and you know it probably started off that way one day but or once once upon a time but you know and the we we do it for the right reasons and we're we're the we're the we're the little guys you know yeah we don't we're, we're just, you start off with little guys but you're doing it the right way because you're using methods that like we said earlier when we started talking about this corporate America shit, you start using the means and methods that are available and free and you let go of that old 90s fucking middle 2000s kind of bullshit propaganda, you're going to realize that you can grow a bigger business and a more fruitful business and a more lucrative for your 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 subscribers and your people that want to learn from you. They can grow more from that because you're doing it with the right people in the right way. We're, we're genuine. Yeah. In, in fact, you know, being genuine, that's what I was telling you about earlier before we started the podcast. People know if you're disingenuine, mm-hmm. if you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, at the end of the show when you're trying to sell them everything that was used in the place. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. We do it for the right. We yeah. are fucking genuine. If, you ever, if anyone listening, you ever watched my YouTube videos, I was genuine. I always was genuine. If I was telling you something, it's because I felt like it. Yeah. I didn't care. I didn't care about what I sold. I didn't care about what I got out of it. All I was is super excited about the knowledge that I had. I was so excited I wanted to fucking shout it from the rooftop. So I went on YouTube and I shouted it there. And that's exactly what we're doing at this thing. Now, we need it to be successful because we want to keep doing it. Not because we're trying to get rich. Nobody's trying to get rich. In fact, I'd make more money if I stayed home. But we want it to be successful because we don't want to lose this platform. We don't want to lose this self-satisfaction, yeah. the reason we do it to begin with. We don't want to become jaded and complacent. We want to sell tickets so we can afford to keep doing it because we're doing it for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. And if ever, if ever there's a time I feel like it's not that way anymore, I won't do it anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's everything. Like, you know, uh, same thing with this podcast. Like, we, we do this podcast, but we, you know, give – we have the people – Offer to do a Patreon, a subscription, things like that. And we have a lot of people that are fucking giving us money for, you know, 
For the, the record, idea. I have no beef against Patreon. No, it's dope. You know, yeah. it's a good idea. And the same thing that's uh, that's good about the art mm-hmm. circus is that you know, I value it. I've I've spent money in my life to go to these places. Unfortunately, it's only been the you know the airbrush getaways for for airbrush action. But man, it it's really nice to see it keep going. And I think that having a, a a congregation of you guys, industry leaders in the custom paint industry to, to teach and people and even guys like myself and plenty of people I know across the country can all value from it. You know, um, uh, a good a good friend of mine, a well respected, very accomplished painter, was just commenting today. There's another there's another thing called like the brush masters getaway. You heard about that? Mm-mm. It's mainly a pinstripers thing. It's okay. mainly for striping and brushing, and it's like a thing they do for that. And this guy's a fucking accomplished painter. You know, he's he's doing it. He's he's making it, and he was stoked because he got a ticket to go see other amazing right. artists do with their thing. And what I think is more important is it. Is it like, no matter what level we are on, I think we can all continue to learn. And that, I think that's the only way to get better is that you always stay humble enough to know that, that you can still learn and grow. You, that classic saying, if the day you think you're too good is the day you get left behind, right? Mm-hmm. So there, there's no such thing as not being able to, to learn. It's that staying fluid, you know? You gotta always be learning, always be climbing that hill. If there's ever a time the hill gets leveled, then you yeah. better look for another fucking hill, cause it, you you can't let yourself be that way. And hopefully, we inspire people. Um, I, I, you know, we're nearing the end of this, so I'm gonna go ahead and plug a few things that I'm doing right now. Um, I personally am taking that to heart, and I'm getting an RV, and we're gonna start. Um, traveling Mm -hmm. around the u.s um my girlfriend and i and um we our purpose is to experience um of course travel and experience the u.s but also we want to get to know people who are like-minded we want to go into the new city like i'm going to be tattooing Mm -hmm. for the most part to make my money and airbrushing whenever the opportunity comes up and um we want to get to know the people in the towns. We want to we want to keep things fresh, you know. Yeah. And, and and if I can go to a new town, so anyone listening, if you're interested in getting a tattoo, or um, maybe you have some stuff that works out for airbrushing, um, then hit or, me. Or like I said, same thing. You know, we talk about that on, on our podcast a lot. But you know, if you're going through a town and you have somebody that that's that is a fan of your artwork, man. Like, hey, dude, if you know the the bar to go to, hit me up. Right. Let's go I want have experience. a beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to go to your bar. Yeah. I want to go to your shop. You know, if you have a motorcycle you've been working on for X amount of years and maybe it's ready for a little bit of color, I'll come throw down. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if uh, you know, we got a place to park the RV <laughs> or whatever, you know, it, that's really what it's about. It's more of a, I want to meet artists that are doing it for the right reasons again. I want to go and experience artists of all genres, whether it be people who build motorcycles or people who do tattoos or do graffiti or um, iron work or whatever it might be and make that a part of our, of our yeah. journey. So, uh, and, and I know that you're still in the groundworks of this idea for your, your own personal podcast, but, you know, Maybe on the spot now, you know, with the the listeners that we have, like, you know, what what do you think you're going to call that podcast? What do you think you're going to brand it as? Oh shit! That yeah. way you can kind of. It's like uh, coming up with a band name. Well, if if, <laughs> if not, then you know what I mean. You're going to have to own. You're going to have to own up to some of your social media so people can mm-hmm. can stay connected to you. So. Yeah, we already have plans. We haven't said or announced. In fact, this is the first any kind of public that I've ever spoke of it mm-hmm. because we wanted to make sure our ducks were in a row. So right now the ducks are all but in a row. I will say that, it, you know, from the concept of your podcast that you're talking about or what, what, what was the other version you called it like the vlog? Yeah. Vlog. So we will be filming a good deal of it and I'm going to announce it on my YouTube channel. Mm. So my new YouTube channel has pretty, pretty much been inactive for a long time because I've been focused on this tattoo stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I'm going to announce on my YouTube channel and on my Instagram, which is, if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's Ryan underscore underscore Townsend. Two spaces. Two spaces, yeah. It's got me. Yeah, got some, me beat. Some, uh, some other kid had my shit. Anyway. <laughs> some other kid had my shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spaced him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, what we're going to do there, um, I'll announce on my Instagram and my social medias and all that, that we're going to be creating new social medias that will host our travels. Yeah. So the, the purpose of it, mainly, I'm going to be guest spotting in different cities doing tattoos. I'm also going to be doing anything that's fucking cool along the way. Yeah. So if I airbrush along the way or I whatever it might be, we're just trying to live life to the fullest and we're also going to, you know, do, you know, I got clients from all over the world might as well come to them you know and so yeah. um see what they're negative yeah and we're, we're gonna go full time with the shit you know we're gonna you know we're not even gonna have a home we're gonna live in our trailer our, our fifth wheel that's exactly what i want to do yeah and I think that's uh, what we all want to do and we're gonna do it as long as possible and fuck uh, the convenience of toilets yeah hey we got you got a toilet though shit, yeah. he's got a toilet we're gonna get a composting toilet yeah there you go. yeah so uh I it, shit in the dirt now we're gonna oh, we're gonna we're gonna vlog the hell out of it and uh, um, please follow us. Please hit us up if you're looking to get any work done by me because anything you do to support us is gonna support what we're doing. So I'm thankful for all. And that, of that. that's that's it, man. That's what's cool. So you're basically you're you're not. Hey, man, support me, and you know I just got an Austin Martin and uh, living. No, LA I don't want to get rich and, off you, motherfuckers. You know, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah, you know? I just want to live the minimum and be able to eat fucking you know good and. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well. we're not. Hey, even if it's a barter situation, man. Like I, we're just trying to live life, man. And and Faith and I have recognized that about ourselves that we're the type of people that are like a river, and we need to keep moving, and um, we want to do it while we still can and so we're looking for support from everyone so if you you if you, you or your friends want to get tattooed in your city hit us up we're not guaranteeing we're going to roll through your city but drop Maybe a line if, it's, if we do we will definitely be interested even if if you have a farm and we can go park out on your farm and and and, and tattoo all your friends while we're out there you know we're, we're willing to do that um, we're also going to guest spot in different cities at different shops so if you know of somebody with a tattoo shop or if you own a tattoo shop and you're interested um and hosting us, then we would be more than willing. But that's going to get serious real, real soon. Mm -hmm. um, I've already been talking. Uh, it's getting serious. Yeah. I've, already, I've already put in my notice at work. I've already put in my notice at home. It, it's happening. And so w we're hoping it's a smooth transition. And uh, anyway, please support us. We may start a Patreon it's not, we're not trying to be beggars. We're just trying to. We're just trying to make Dude, the this. Patreon, source. you know, when you start putting out the content, I think it's fair that if people uh, care about what you're doing and they're taking, they're taking value from right. That. Even if it's your value is just because you like watching our YouTube videos and you feel entertained mm -hmm. by them, and it gives you a positive something to do when you go home at night, um, then we would really appreciate if we do start a Patreon, which we likely will. Um, Support us. Uh, we, we, when I say we're doing it for the right reasons, I mean it. And, and it's not, you know. We, yeah, it's not like you're going to see Ryan like one week later, like after he starts his Patreon, like, check out this fucking Rolex, bitch. No. No. Paid cash, Patreon. No, nah, I, I just, I guess I've got my priorities <laughs> uh, straight, you know. Like, it, it all stems back to that original idea of going to uh, Hawaii. You know, I couldn't go to Hawaii with no skills, you yeah. know. So I had to spend these 10 years. Um, getting my skills straight and now I've got them, you know, and now it's time to, to, to do that Hawaii trip, which happens to be bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. And bigger. so, uh, and, and luckily for us, you know, my girlfriend's in a, can do it with me and, um, we got our two cats with us and th that's what we're going to do. Hell like, yeah. 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 Got these cats, man. Yeah. Uh, gonna, that's, that's, that's it, man. I, I feel like, uh, you know, we were kind of touching bases on this earlier, and I'm not trying to drag this out any longer than it has been, but, man, like, it's there really is something in the water, man. It, it is something in the water. We're Our generation, 
you know, being a grouping here thing of like, you know, Jesse's a lot younger than us, but you know, just our generation of like how we're all interacting with the, the, the social media and the world that we have. It's just, there's no incentive for, for what we were growing up thinking we needed. There's no yeah. incentive to buy a house. There's mm-hmm. no incentive to do. Right. Like you all own these- land, but will your, an- will, will your land own you? I mean, truthfully, I mean, it, it Different strokes for different folks, man. True, yeah. Did you just admit to being a millennial, Jace? Pretty much. I, I guess yeah. if that's what makes us millennials, so fuck it. You know, whatever. Yeah. You know, you, you I, just, I always thought we were Generation he, X. He, but he, was he was saying it best, man. He was saying it best, and it's the same thing I feel. It's like, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. There's got to no. be, like... No, it's 100% There's true. no way, like, once I gain the ability to travel, and I start, and I've said this before, I'm sorry if I'm repeating it, but... If uh, if you go to a town, whether it's L.A. or whether it's some hobuck town in the middle of nowhere, and you're like just floored by its beauty or by its culture, and you can't help but think about like, man, like what would it be like to grow up in this place? What would it like to be have a family here? What would it be like to go to that bar right there all the time and you know figure out how to get home right. every night? It it really can put you in a different mindset of like, man, like. You know, especially if you grow up watching movies and you, you know, you watch these movies from different areas of the world or areas of the continent or, you know, United States, you're constantly like, you know, maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe you're comparing, you know what I mean? But just, or maybe you're just open minded to like, man, like, how would that have been? What would that experience have been like to, to grow up in Illinois instead of Texas? I don't think I've, I've been telling my clients for about two months. Mm-hmm. That this is what I'm doing. I haven't had a single one think that that was crazy. No, they, because every single on the... one of them are like, "Take me, hell yeah, <laughs> yeah." And so I don't think you have to explain yourself. I, you I think everyone gets it, and um, you know, a lot of people. What do you, ma- before we get too deep into quitting here, <laughs> what do you what do you think <laughs> motivated you? Mainly to, to get on this trip. The, to to want to hit the road? Yeah. You want a story about that too? Yeah, definitely. That's, okay. That's actually a really good thing we need to talk about. All right. Um, Sorry, We need guys. to talk about. Okay, so uh, there was some major changes happening um, in my current situation. And I had to make a decision on whether I wanted to um, keep doing what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Or find something else to do, and whatever. I had to, I had to do some evaluations. Mm-hmm. Is what I'm saying in my life. And after doing those evaluations, I'm trying to be vague here because I don't want to upset anyone. But um, I thought um, I want to move to Florida. But I also want to move to Colorado. But I also want to move to California. Yeah. But I also want to do this in Dallas, too. And I want everything, but I also want nothing. So we also knew that every time we would come home from a travel, we would think, I wish we could stay, but we have all these bills and these responsibilities back at home and these things that we have mm-hmm. that have grounded us. And with every moment that we keep doing this, the, it gets deeper. I mean, it's a matter of time before we have a kid and you know, that grounds us or whatever it might be. And so pull out. <laughs> well, it might not even be that, but you know what I'm saying? Just everybody out there that's just pull out every day that passes. You're, you're digging the, yeah. the, 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 the the anchor gets a little deeper. You're digging your own grave every yeah, day. Yeah, so we were like, I was trying to come up, and I, I say we because I don't know who came up with the idea, but um, I was trying to come up with something that I wanted to do, and I was completely, like, I had all these great ideas that I knew would be successful, but I didn't want to commit to any of them. Yeah. So I things. was just like, you know what? Fuck it. And I brought this up to Faith. I was like, what if we just like got an RV and hit the road and she looked at me like, duh, you know what I'm saying? Duh. Finally, you thought about that. Yeah, yeah. Like I've been thinking that for a month now. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> where, where have you been? Fucking nerd, man. And so like, uh, I was like, that's what we're doing. That's what we're fucking doing then. 
And um, so ever since then, we've been doing everything in our power to make it happen. And yeah. so th- at pretty much every waking moment that I'm not tattooing or I'm not doing something el- else, I'm, I'm making that happen. And, um, Hell yeah. Uh, so we're going to hit the road because we want to do everything. We want to experience everything. Again, the listeners, I'm starting to forget that I'm even on a podcast now. But if you want to be a part of that, hit, hit us up. Yeah. Find me on Instagram and, or Facebook or whatever it might be. Um, follow us on our new social medias when that gets started because we're going to take it serious. Yeah, I'm going to tag everybody in your Instagram so they'll be able to follow you on there and then it'll be your responsibility to, to show people. Oh, yeah. I'm going to tell as soon as, it, as soon as it gets solid, we're not going to announce it 100% official until I drive off the lot yeah. with that but fifth wheel. Now that it's taking place, I definitely want to do this again after you've had some of the experiences on the road. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah and we're going to do it. the hell out of it. Like, we, we got a lot to, to learn and the more the people listening can help us out whether it be by just tuning in Mm -hmm. showing support um buying products that we might hawk you know if we're selling stuff on our stuff by the way if we're 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 not selling it because we're trying to fucking get rich off you guys we're just selling it we're just trying to support the cause you know so every dollar spent on whether it be a t-shirt or a painting or a tattoo or whatever it might be that you know just know that you know we're not trying to take advantage of anything. We're just trying to like, you know, live you're gonna, life. You're not gonna go to South Beach and get bottle service. <laughs> yeah, and if we do, hopefully it was it's free. Yeah, free. <laughs> or maybe, or maybe one of one of the people online. You know, hey, you want to come here and get free bottle service? Yeah, fuck it. Yeah, it's free. You know? But yeah, again, we're not, we're not, we're just trying to do this because we feel like it's it's something yeah. we need to do. So we're gonna. No, do travel it. travel is the answer to everything. Mm-hmm. I think. Um, It'll humble you uh, because it'll make you realize how small you are in such a massive thing. And, you know, no matter what industry you're in, whether you're the best airbrush artist or the best bike builder, the whatever you are, you're still smaller than this country. Mm-hmm. You're still smaller than the history. Again, our travels, I hope to not really be about us. Yeah. I hope it's about the people we meet. Mm-hmm. The experiences, not our personal. I don't want to sit there with a camera in my own face yeah. saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. Mm-hmm. I want to say, look at you, you know, look what the world has to offer, whether it be the people or the land mm-hmm. or the shops or whatever it might be. I want to do it for the right reasons. I'm not selling anything. I'm not selling you handbags or fucking paint or whatever. I'm just enjoying life while i'm alive and sharing it just as like i said when i made my youtube channel i did it because i fucking loved it yeah but somebody inspired you to want it and you can be an inspiration to a lot of i hope so you know i hope so and i hope that comes across i hope that we keep it genuine and i hope that is never something that is overlooked Mm -hmm. i and and if you're entertained by it then good I hope I hope you are. I hope when you watch our videos or whatever whatever we start putting up, um, I hope I, you're entertained and inspired. I also think that you know by doing that, you're actually going to uh, give yourself a better foundation for anything you want to do in the rest of your life. You know, I mean, obviously, maybe for some, you know, I, I imagine the travel thing will run its course. Yes and no. It'll run its course in a certain. Uh, manner but it's not necessarily gonna run its course because like me i feel like if i travel to the united states which i'm already on a, a level where i want to just see the rest of the world right, right. it's just like this i want to see everything i want to see everything i want to see those colorful mountains in china yeah exactly <laughs> what's that all about yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know i feel like if, if you get enough of it i feel like just about just like anything whether it's us going to have beers one night eventually you're going to be like i'm good now Right. I'm I'm okay. I'm right. now I'm complacent enough to where I want to go back and just really enjoy something. I want to sit on a back porch and drink a beer and just yeah. smell the air. I want to look at. Yeah. I want to be wind in the country. down from life. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like uh, some people might be in that point of winding down from life, and they might be sitting on that back porch drinking tea or a beer, and feel like, "Fuck! I wish I would have did this and I did that." Now that you know, now that they're at this point of like clarity. I, I believe that even people, through your inspiration, you're giving them something like that. Like, for instance, the people I watch on YouTube, personally, I, I, 
I love that they're doing what they're doing because they're entertaining my evening at home. It's almost like a vicariously living through them kind yeah. of situation. And I think there's value even in that. I think, you know, even if you're inspiring somebody through just the joy they get through whatever it is that you're doing, I think that's valuable. I mean, what you talk, you see, you kept saying Roseanne over and over again, but what is Roseanne if not just something to occupy somebody's time? Yeah. And something to inspire any kind of TV show for that matter. There's value in entertainment and there's value in that. And I don't know. I, it depends on if you're using that entertainment to blockade yourself from the life that you live or if you're doing it just to... I hope it's inspirational. Yeah. To look for something else. Yeah. yeah. I hope it's not something to occupy yourself and, and help you sink deeper into your couch cushion. Yeah. I hope it's something that once makes you want to get off your ass. Yeah, exactly. I hope it's something that what it doesn't have to be travel. Like I said again, if you got that car in your fucking garage that you've been meaning to fucking work on and you haven't worked on it, get off your fucking ass and work on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I hope so. I I hope that's what it does. You know, because one day you're gonna be driving down the road in that fucking car and you're gonna feel pretty fucking good. It's gonna be Those nice. are good words to end on, right there. Yeah. <laughs> well. So, what's your Instagram again? Ryan, Ryan under, under, underscore underscore Townsend. There you go. Hell yeah, dude. Uh, it, awesome, man. I think that I, I wanted a paint podcast and I got a life podcast. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the best thing. Um, so, fuck yeah. So, dude. if you got a car sitting in your garage that you've just Get been off your meaning, fucking ass, you lazy bastard. You've been meaning to work on. <laughs> go fucking do it. Because one day... You're gonna be driving it or down if your the road, wife's a bitch, feeling pretty. And fucking you're cool. sick of her shit, and you just want to go be <laughs> like backpack across the United States. <laughs> Fuck that hoe. <laughs> or if you're Jace and you're seven beers deep right now, and you didn't say anything stupid the whole I think podcast. People listening right now are going. You should like, feel are they really done? good. Are they fucking no, dude. We're just. This is a false ending. <laughs> 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 we're, we're gonna keep it. No, I'm kidding. No, no but for real, we gotta we gotta cut it. It's How long, long are we right now? We are at three hours and sixteen minutes. All yeah. right. Good for our you. second longest podcast Fucking and our first longest one is that our most uh, congratulations to Joe Kid. He's our first podcast to get over eleven hundred listeners. Hell yeah, Dang. that motherfucker. He was talking. I about hope some people good don't shit. hate me. Sorry, sorry. Nah, dude. No, this they'll hate quality. me because I'm the dude that's like, you know, <laughs> fuck you, corporate America. You know, give me, you know. No. Hey man, uh, thanks for coming out. Gonna ah, go ahead and happy. yeah, for sure, man. In this, cool. yeah. So. uh forgot to tell you guys we took a couple of breaks uh <laughs> I, I apologize i guess it's a little too late now you know yeah it's over with now well i hope you like that shit and i hope you you know for all the the airbrush guys out there the artist friends that, that listen to our stuff the painters uh we gave some substance for your you know yeah. work day and if you're whatever. still if you're still listening right now then congratulations because <laughs> holy shit it was pretty long yeah, I think it was a good one, man. I was I was happy to have him on there. I was happy to bring another, another you know topic other than motorcycles to the right. table, but still relative to it. It was, it was it. refreshing. Yeah. Um. So, fuck, man. Happy. Thank you, Ryan, for coming on. Um. As always, don't forget to check out our sponsors, man. TexasPerformanceMC.com. Uh, PainHufferMetalFlake.com. No, PainHuffer.com. PainHuffer.com, motherfucker. MCShopTees.com. Uh, don't forget about our little. I keep saying hour, but just don't forget about the DFW, uh, Dyna and FXR. Uh, he bike means night. ours and all of DFW. It's yeah, everybody. exactly. Uh, DFW. If you if you guys haven't checked out, uh, for you Dallas folks that are, are uh, around here, even North Texas, whatever. Uh, the, the DFW Dinas and FXRs is kind of like a, a page on Instagram for a lot of the homies here in DFW to kind of link up and get exposure and meet each other and things like that. Right. It's, a, it's like a Tinder for dudes, I guess you'd say. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. So. 100%. Um, <laughs> All the dudes I've met so far are super cool. I guess it is Tinder for dudes. Yeah, yeah. it's exactly what it is. I mean, <laughs> there's no way around it. I mean, I can pull up Tinder right now and do the same thing, but yeah. with chicks. So There you go. So yeah. uh, don't forget, that's going to be tonight at 8 p.m. Anvil Pub if you guys want to come out. Uh, I know myself, I should be out there for a little while, if not the whole time, like I was the time before. Uh, also, what, what else? Oh, yeah, don't forget, you know, we haven't Patreon. talked about it. Patreon. Yeah, Patreon. We've been getting more people on there. Um, guess I could find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
find some shout outs for some folks. Uh, let's see who we got last time. Adam Butler, five bucks. You're the shit, homie. Appreciate that. Um, Ooh, five dollars. Yeah. Damn, I'm sorry. Going big. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, don't forget, you can go through um, our website, fastlifegarage.com, and catch that link to Patreon and donate whatever you feel like. Uh, the more the merrier for us, obviously. Yeah. Um, and we're going to put it to good use. We're going to put it in a gas tank. We're going to put it in equipment. We're going to put it in things to make this podcast better. You know what I mean? With its new, like reaching other guests, uh, investing in things to make video, which we've been doing, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it just helps us in doing all the other shit. Also, you know, don't forget to check out our Instagram, Fast Life Garage. Or Fast, the Fast Life Garage. <laughs> Uh, fast life, Jesse. All yeah. separated. Right? Yeah, fast space, life space, Jesse space. And if you want to see my selfies and stuff like that, you can catch me on Fast Life Jace. One word, no spaces. I'm not about that life. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, by the way, speaking of that, thanks for like you know everybody who's followed me so far. Because I mean, I asked, better? yeah, it's like I got like 50, almost 100 nice. more people. And it's only been like two weeks, so good job, guys. I haven't even posted shit. Wow. Yeah, they just wow. did it out of a pure help you out kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, they probably, it's like a, oh, I'm sorry, man, it sucks for you. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, check all that shit out. Uh, this morning, actually, uh, when I first woke up, I met up with Big Joe from Snap Fabrications up in uh, South Dakota. He was coming through Dallas on the way back from a hand-built show. Uh, three hour podcast. So get ready for that on Thursday. Sadly, I was not involved. Yeah, Jesse had a doctor's appointment. Doctor's appointment. So mm-hmm. uh, we sat down, and talked a lot about a cool stuff. It was, a, it was another great perspective on uh, industry and motorcycles. And you know, he's a big uh, FXR guy, FXR yeah. fan. Uh, created. He actually is the curator for the FXR show the in Sturgis. Sturgis. Yeah. And um, I think you'll like that one. Uh, we. We kind of touched on a lot of pretty good p- topics in three hours, so I'm pretty I'm pretty excited to get that one out. So, be I'm looking for that on Thursday. I'm loving how long we're we're getting these. Well, you're just we're getting content like guys with shit to say and mm, and it's me nice. with shit to rebuttal or fill rebuttal the space or whatever Ooh. you want to say. Anyway, uh, if you're coming out tonight, see you guys there. If not, we'll be back on Thursday. Yeah. All right. All right. There you go. See you later, Peace. fellas.